Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of this video is not for the faint of heart. If somebody told you I was just your average Raimi fanboy, if somebody said all I've done is watch the Holy Trilogy and nothing more, somebody lied. I, like many of you, adore Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy to death. It was my first exposure to the character of Spider-Man, and because these movies had a huge impact on me as a kid, they were the major influence behind my love for comics. In today's world where the film industry is dominated by the constant creation and success of superhero films based off of these comics, and despite the world having seen two different live-action reboots of the Spider-Man character, there's just something special about the Sam Raimi trilogy that keeps pulling me back. It might be because not only are these movies fantastically made, and because I was able to connect with them more so than newer films, but a huge chunk of my childhood was spent playing those movie tie-in games for the PlayStation 2. Some of my earliest memories can be tied back to playing these games over and over for hours on end. Not only did these games do a great job at recapping their respective movies, but they expanded upon those stories by including villains and storylines that we didn't see throughout the three movies. In recent years, I've also stumbled upon those novelizations written by Peter David that help expand upon some scenes in the movies and give further insight into the way certain characters are written. The lore behind Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy is pretty expansive if you include the tie-in games, comics, and novelizations, because they all take their creative liberties to separate themselves from the movies that they were based on, all while expanding the world of Earth-96283. But have you ever wondered what would happen if you took all the events from these different pieces of media and combined them into one cohesive timeline? In today's video, I'm gonna do just that by taking a look over the entirety of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man universe, recapping and trying to make sense of what happens and when. Before we begin though, please keep in mind that the only things canon to Sam Raimi's trilogy is in fact the trilogy itself, aka the three movies that he directed. Other pieces of media such as the novels and games have absolutely no effect on the canon dates that we see throughout the films. Now, since we are dealing with a lot of extended lore here, just know that there will be a few inconsistencies here and there that I will be addressing as the video goes on, and I'll do my best to work my way around them. This is of course not an official timeline, it's just my own gatherings of evidence and speculation when watching, reading, and playing all things Raimi Spider-Man related. So without any further ado, we have a lot of recapping to get to. This is the complete timeline for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. The Raimi timeline truly begins in August of 1983 when Peter is born as the son of Richard and Mary Parker. His birthday is only stated to be in August with no official date, but to fully make sense of future events in this timeline, let's say his birthday is August 13th. The three live in Wisconsin up until 1988 when Richard and Mary are both killed in an accidental plane crash when Peter is just four years old. Miss Hemmings, a social worker, delivers Peter to the home of Ben and May Parker, better known as Uncle Ben and Aunt May. They are now Peter's legal guardians. Hesitant at first, Peter eventually settles into Ben and May's home, but due to his young age, is having a hard time coping with the death of his parents. Ben tries talking to the child, but Peter goes on to tell him that they were actually secret agents killed by the supervillain known as Red Skull. No doubt an idea that he created to cope with this tragedy. Now, while we only ever get a reference to Captain America's existence through comic books that Peter owns, it's never confirmed if Captain America is just a fictional character in this universe, or if he was actually a real person with comics based on him. That's up for you to decide. After this, Ben decides to give Peter a journal for him to write in whenever he wants to talk to his parents, which is something he'll use for many years to document his thoughts. From this point forward, Peter's relationship with both Ben and May begins to improve, and the three become a loving family. Two years later in 1990, Mary Jane Watson and her parents, Madeline and Philip Watson, move in next door to Peter Parker, who is now six years old. Peter forms a crush on Mary Jane and attends all of the school plays that she stars in, such as Cinderella, which he remembers for years to come. Around this time period, a young Peter comes home from school surprised to see Uncle Ben home from work early. Ben sends Peter up to his room to change clothes so the two of them can fly his model rocket in their garage, but the reason he sent Peter away was so he and May could talk about their financial situation. Ben's job has been cutting off his hours recently, and May is worried about whether or not they'll be able to make ends meet as Peter overhears the situation. This would mark the beginning of the family's money issues. Around this time, Otto Octavius is enrolled in college, studying under a major in science hoping to pursue his lifelong goal of sustainable fusion. 
During his time on campus, Otto would eventually meet Rosie, a fellow student who was studying English literature. The two would fall in love and eventually get married. Sadly though, the two of them would never be able to have children to pass their intelligence onto, but they were happy, just the two of them. On an undetermined date, Dr. Curtis Connors, a talented surgeon, travels overseas to a war zone in an attempt to aid soldiers. While overseas, Kurt's job was to patch up any injured soldiers he could, but in the midst of combat, he unfortunately lost one of his arms. Upon returning home, Kurt was no longer able to perform surgery with only one arm, and proceeded to become a physics teacher at Columbia University, spending his free time researching the genetics of lizards and other reptiles. In the Raimi universe, Columbia University is often mixed up with Empire State University, or ESU for short. ESU is a fictional college that Peter attends in the comics, and considering there's no evidence that deems these two colleges as separate entities, I'm chalking these two up to be the exact same campus, just referred to by different names time to time. Flint Marco begins working under successful con man Johnny O and meets his future wife, Emma. The two fall in love, and sometime in 1996, they have a baby girl, who they name Penny. Johnny O eventually cuts Flint from his crew due to his recklessness, and the Marco family begins to fall into financial issues. Emma constantly berates Flint to get a job so the two can support their daughter, who has been deathly ill with a rare disease ever since a very young age. During his search for a regular job, Flint has a run-in with Dennis Carradine, who has most likely been a member of the Skulls Gang for quite some time. Scared and desperate, needing money for a sick daughter, Flint does some side jobs with the gang to get some quick money for his family. Around this time, Michael Morbius marries Frances Barrison, and the two strive to create a family together. He pursues his career of being a biochemist as he begins work at Oscorp. His main source of study has always been bats, as he's been keen on developing a cure for his rare blood disease. However, due to his reclusiveness from his co-workers, he was often made fun of and pursued this goal on his own outside of Oscorp. Starting in 1997, Columbia's Genetic Research Institute at Columbia University begin work on interspecies genetic transmutation. They spend the next five painstaking years genetically enhancing spiders by incorporating the genetic codes from different species of spiders and placing them all into one super spider. There are 15 of these super spiders once they finish their experiments. Around this same time, after having flunked out of several private schools much to his father's dismay, Harry Osborne ends up at Midtown High. He strikes up a friendship with Peter Parker, hoping he'll do his papers for him, but rather than taking this rich kid's money, Peter helps Harry study and perform research on his own assignments. Not only does Harry become friends with Peter, but he also becomes interested in Mary Jane Watson, who begins a relationship with Flash Thompson, the star quarterback for their school, and the bully to Peter Parker. On his 13th birthday, Harry is given a boogie board by his father, Norman Osborne, due to his recent improvement in school thanks to Peter, and is taken to the beach to test it out. Watching Harry and other kids use boogie boards and by studying their techniques on the water, Norman gets the initial idea for glider technology, and later on, performance enhancers that Oscorp, his own company, develops for the United States military over the next several years. Fast forward a few years to 2002. A few days before Peter's field trip to Columbia University, Uncle Ben is laid off of work after 35 years of being a plant senior electrician due to company downsizing. He struggles to find work in this new day and age where computers are becoming more and more common. Nearing the end of his senior year in high school, a now 18-year-old Peter Parker is running late after a school bus while everyone watches and mocks him. He and his classmates are on a Midtown High School field trip to the Science Department of Columbia University. After some harassment on the bus, Peter arrives on campus and meets up with Harry, who both attend a demonstration of all the Institute's spiders. Peter's class learns about the different species one by one through a tour guide and learn about the existence of super spiders. One of them, however, is missing and bites Peter Parker, giving him spider-like powers. After dropping Harry off and having a small chat with Peter, Norman Osborn heads towards a business meeting and runs into J. Jonah Jameson, the publisher for the Daily Bugle. The two discuss the potential downfall of the newspaper industry due to everyone now getting their news from television and the internet. Norman inspires Jonah to seek out that one story that will keep people interested in his paper. Soon after, Norman arrives at Oscorp and proceeds to demonstrate their glider technology and performance enhancer formula to the Oscorp Board of Directors and General Slocum of the United States military. Dr. Mendel Strom informs Slocum of the unstable testing and warns him of the side effects of the enhancers. Slocum threatens to pull funding for the enhancers and give it to Quest Aerospace if testing for the performance enhancers isn't complete within two weeks' time. 
That evening, Peter returns home from his field trip and passes out in his room, falling victim to the effects of his spider bite. That night, a desperate Norman who doesn't want to give up his funding to a rival company decides to test the performance enhancers on himself and falls victim to the drug's side effects. He kills Mendel Strom and steals the glider technology. Waking up the next morning, Peter feels a lot better and notices physical changes on his body, such as more defined muscles. Change? Yeah. Big change. Harry discovers his father in the den of their massive home who doesn't remember anything about the previous night. Norman's assistant Miss Simpkins comes into the room to inform Norman that Dr. Strom had been murdered and the glider technology was stolen. At school, Peter proceeds to discover his spider-like powers by fighting Flash Thompson and making a fool out of him. Peter decides to skip school and for the remainder of the day, tests out his abilities that consist of wall crawling, enhanced speed and agility, and most notably, organic webbing that he can fire from his wrists. Mary Jane tells her parents about the fight between Flash and Peter with her father who has taken a liking to Flash defending him. Peter returns home realizing he lost track of time and forgot that he promised to help paint the kitchen with Uncle Ben after school. Mary Jane and her father get into an argument as Peter takes out the trash, overhearing his verbal abuse. The two begin to talk about their dreams beyond high school with MJ opening up about her dreams of acting, giving Peter his first insight into her true personality. Flash arrives to pick MJ up in his new car, and Peter gets inspired to earn some money to impress her with his own car. Deciding on making money through underground wrestling, Peter starts to design costumes for his wrestling persona, with one of them being the classic red and blue design we all know and love. Throughout the next several days, Peter continues to hone his skills in preparation for the upcoming match. At the same time, Flint Marco and Dennis Carradine begin planning on robbing the fight promoter of his money. The day of Peter's match finally arrives and to avoid any suspicion, he comes up with the excuse of going to study at the library. Uncle Ben offers to drive him there hoping to talk about his changing attitude and about all the fights that he's gotten into recently at school. Uncle Ben proceeds to give Peter the with great power comes great responsibility talk only for Peter to shut him down by telling him that he needs to stop pretending to be his father, a statement that he'll regret for the rest of his life. Defeated and hurt by these words, Ben leaves as Peter heads towards the wrestling arena to sign up. Donning the human spider outfit, Peter watches as his opponent Bonesaw McGraw easily goes through wrestlers left and right, with one of them actually being Jack Murdock, Daredevil's father. Uncle Ben returns home and watches wrestling on TV to get his mind off of what Peter said, and Aunt May joins him. The two tune in to watch the Bonesaw matches live. Suiting up as the human spider, Peter is given the name of Spider-Man by the announcer, and proceeds to fight Bonesaw in a cage match. Hey, freak show! You're going nowhere! I got you for three minutes! Three minutes of play time! Giving the audience a show, Peter manages to pin Bonesaw in a quicker time than what was expected thanks to his spider powers. After the match, the Flying Dutchman, a fellow wrestler who had attempted to take down Bonesaw, refers Peter to his brother, who just so happens to be a tailor in case he ever wants to upgrade his costume and go pro. Rather than being given the $3,000 that was advertised, Peter is only given $100 by the fight promoter, and so he leaves in a huff. But before we move on, I'd like to point out that in the movie, the fight promoter's paper lists the date as June 21st, which doesn't make sense as Peter hasn't graduated high school yet, and if this date were correct, we would already be well into summer by this point. Dennis Carradine walks in at the same time and robs the remainder of the money and dashes off, with Peter letting him get away to get back at the fight promoter. Meanwhile, Uncle Ben has arrived back at the library to pick Peter up, but Flint Marco coaxes him out of his car. He tries to steal the car, but Ben proceeds to try and talk him out of it. Dennis rushes out towards his partner and accidentally forces Flint to pull the trigger on his gun, shooting Uncle Ben on the spot. Dennis abandons Flint and steals Ben's car in order to get away, leaving Flint on his own with a dying man. Flint most likely runs off as the cops discover Ben and his gunshot wounds. Returning to the street, Peter follows cop cars and discovers Uncle Ben's body. He rushes over to him, and his uncle dies in his arms as the cops lock onto Carradine's location. As the human spider, Peter chases after the stolen car, web-swinging for the first time. He tracks Carradine down to an abandoned warehouse and confronts him out of anger, accidentally making Carradine tumble out of a nearby window and fall to his death. The cops down below notice Peter and believe he's the second convict in Ben's homicide, forcing Peter to leave in a hurry. Later on that night, the cops track down Flint Marco and take him into custody. Being tied to Dennis Carradine, who at the time was believed to be Uncle Ben's killer, Emma divorces Flint Marco. 
It's most likely that due to the capture of Flint and the death of Dennis, the rest of the Skulls gang was either apprehended by the police force or became inactive over the next few weeks. Two weeks would pass since General Slocum's threat of defunding Oscorp, and the Quest Aerospace Bunker is bombed by Norman Osborn, who later is referred to as the Green Goblin. Attending an exoskeleton test, General Slocum is killed alongside other scientists, and the funding for Oscorp doesn't get pulled due to this tragedy. A little over a month after Uncle Ben's death, Peter finally graduates high school alongside Harry, and the two notice Mary Jane dump Flash Thompson, who had supposedly proposed to her. At home, Peter gets rid of the human spider suit, vowing to live up to Ben's words focusing on great power and great responsibility, and begins working on his official red and blue Spider-Man suit. He takes all of his drawing designs of the Spider-Man suit to the Flying Dutchman's brother, the tailor he had talked about a while back at the Bonesaw Wrestling event. The tailor takes Peter's designs and creates the Spider-Man suit for him. Taking to the streets as Spider-Man, Peter starts off slow by taking down muggers, carjackers, and just about any crime he can prevent. After slowly revealing himself to the public, people begin to adjust to the idea that there is now a web-slinging vigilante watching over them, with many believing Spider-Man to either be a myth or some type of creature. The Daily Bugle tries to capture pictures of Spider-Man so they can keep their paper business afloat, but ultimately have no luck. During this time, Peter and Harry move in together into an apartment that Norman let them live in upon moving into the city. The two are now preparing to go to college at Columbia University, with Peter working a paid internship under Dr. Kurt Connors. Mary Jane, now working at the Moondance Diner, gets in contact with Aunt May, hoping to get Peter's phone number and address. She heads over to his apartment hoping to talk to him, but runs into Harry instead, and proceeds to go out to dinner with him, sparking a relationship between the two. Peter ends up being late one day to his internship due to Spider-Man activities and is ultimately fired by Dr. Connors, thus he begins searching for a new job. Mary Jane runs into Peter sometime after this and lets him know that she and Harry are now dating, a secret that Harry has been keeping from him. Later that day, Peter is offered a job by Norman at Oscorp, but he declines and is instead encouraged to seek out a job at the Daily Bugle. Beginning to take photos of himself, Peter gives them to J. Jonah Jameson, and is hired onto the Daily Bugle as a freelance photographer for his incredible Spider-Man shots. With the Bugle now being the best source for Spider-Man news, Jameson begins to slander Spider-Man as a menace on the front page, much to Peter's dismay. With Spider-Man now widely known within the public, Oscorp plans on moving forward with their performance enhancer formula after the ordeal with the Quest Aerospace bombing. Believing Spider-Man's DNA could serve some use in perfecting the formula, Oscorp traces his location and sends quote-unquote hunter-killer robots to capture him. There is, however, a plot hole here, as in the Spider-Man movie game, Dr. Strom is still alive, but for the sake of this timeline, we could easily swap him out with any other Oscorp scientist. While out taking pictures of himself for the Bugle, Spider-Man is found by the hunter-killer robots and he destroys them easily, going about his business. Meanwhile, up in the Bronx, Adrian Toomes impatiently rides the subway towards Midtown. Recently, Adrian struck up a partnership with fellow criminal Herman Schultz, also known as the Shocker, with the two planning on making a big break at Cullen's Jewelry. Spider-Man stumbles upon the robbery and watches Adrian, now suited up as the Vulture, leaving the scene of the crime. Shocker and his goons also attempt to escape the crime scene, but Spider-Man manages to catch their van, forcing it to crash. Shocker and his goons rush into Grand Central Station, and Spider-Man follows them inside. Rescuing hostages and fighting a large chunk of Shocker's men, Spider-Man chases Shocker down into the sewer systems below Grand Central, where he proceeds to take out even more of his goons. The chase continues through the sewer until the two end up in a nearby subway tunnel, where Spider-Man finally confronts Shocker and defeats him, leaving him for the police. Not wanting Adrian to keep all the money for himself, Shocker betrays Vulture, revealing his base of operations. Tracking Vulture down to a workshop he set up in an old clock tower on the Lower East Side, Spider-Man begins to ascend the tower towards Vulture's lair, who has rigged the tower with traps. Upon reaching the top, Vulture escapes from Spidey's grasp, and the web-slinger is forced to pursue him through the city skyline. Chasing him through the rain, Spider-Man ends the chase at the Chrysler building, and bests Vulture in combat. He regains all the stolen loot from Colin's jewelry, and leaves the geezer for the police. Several days later, Oscorp's systems begin to detect another target resembling Spider-Man's DNA. Hoping to have a better chance at trying to capture both after the first failed attempt at capturing Spidey, Norman sends hunter-killer robots to lure the two targets into the same area. This time, however, Oscorp sends upgraded hunter-killer robots, now bearing the characteristics of a spider, after Mac Gargan, the Scorpion. 
These Spider Slayer robots chase him through the sewer systems towards the location of Spider-Man. At the same time, Peter returns to the subway station where he had fought Shocker so he can take photos of the repairs, but encounters Scorpion and the Spider Slayers in a parking garage on the way there. Teaming up with Scorpion, the two take out the Spider Slayer robots, and a schizophrenic Scorpion attacks Spider-Man, believing that he too is out to get him. Scorpion tries to escape, but Spider-Man confronts him in Grand Central Station where the two fight. Spidey defeats Scorpion and investigates a lone Spider Slayer that followed after them, wondering who keeps sending these robots after him. While distracted, Spidey doesn't notice Scorpion run off, disappearing for the time being. Sometime later, Oscorp has officially surpassed Quest Aerospace as the principal supplier to the United States military, most likely having perfected their performance enhancer formula. Ultimately, with revenue being up for Oscorp, the board of directors decide to sell the company to Quest Aerospace, who are recapitalizing their company after the bombing. Norman is forced to resign from Oscorp within 30 days as the sale is to be announced after the third annual World Unity Festival. When the festival finally arrives, Peter is sent to take pictures for the Bugle and spots Harry and MJ on a nearby balcony. Harry also spots Peter and realizes that a secret has been discovered. The Green Goblin arrives at the festival and kills the Oscorp board members, hoping to halt the selling of the company. Before he can hurt anyone else, Peter suits up as Spider-Man and has a quick scuffle with him, with MJ getting caught in the crossfire. Goblin retreats from the fight, and Spidey rescues MJ, taking her away from the danger. Spidey drops her off at a roof garden nearby Rockefeller Center, where MJ begins to develop a crush on him, much to the disapproval of Harry. By this point, Norman begins to mentally struggle against his other personality as the Goblin, and vows to convert Spider-Man to his side, knowing that he could potentially become a threat in the future. Later at the Daily Bugle, Jameson finally refers to the Green Goblin by name, just as the Goblin attacks the Bugle. Looking for Spider-Man's photographer, hoping to track him down, Goblin attacks Jameson, and Spider-Man steps in to rescue him, but gets gassed with a paralysis mist and is kidnapped. That night, Spider-Man wakes up and the Goblin tries to persuade him into joining his side, pointing out that the public will eventually hate his stunts as a hero. Spidey initially declines the offer, but is given time to think about it as the Goblin takes off. A few minutes pass and the paralysis wears off. Spider-Man tracks Goblin down and learns that he has planted bombs filled with deadly gas throughout downtown Manhattan to test the hero. Given the choice to chase after Goblin or disarm the bombs, Spider-Man goes after the bombs and manages to disarm them all planning on finding the Goblin another day. The next day, Jameson paints Spider-Man as a menace working alongside the Green Goblin after the attack on the Daily Bugle. With this statement being published, the city slowly begins to divide views on whether or not Spider-Man is actually a menace or not. That night, Mary Jane attends her first audition under a casting director named April Reese, but despite performing rather well, she gets rejected and is told that she needs acting lessons. April Reese turns out to be the aunt of Flash Thompson, and was simply getting payback for MJ dumping him at their high school graduation. Peter meets MJ at her audition and has a quick chat with her, only to watch a few muggers follow after her. Peter proceeds to suit up and rescue MJ from them, where the two engage in their first kiss, the famous upside down kiss. A few days pass and Norman Osborn hires Kraven the Hunter to track and hunt Spider-Man down. Craven arrives in the city and burns a wooden spider monument on the rooftop of a local zoo to call the hero out. Seeing the burning spider from his window, Jameson tells Peter to head down to the zoo and take pictures, believing Spider-Man is involved. Heading over to the zoo as Spider-Man, Craven confronts the hero and offers a contest of strength between the two to see who is superior. Craven gasses Spider-Man, poisoning him, and forces him to seek the antidote. Spidey dodges all of Craven's traps that he set up in the zoo and confronts him, besting him in combat. Being given the antidote, Spider-Man leaves Craven for the cops. Some time passes and the season of fall hits New York City. Peter is out patrolling as Spider-Man and comes across a burning building. He steps in to rescue a baby from the building and gets ambushed by the Green Goblin. The two get into a quick scuffle and Spider-Man gets cut on the wrist by one of Goblin's razor bats. The hero disappears as the Goblin becomes upset that Spider-Man has officially declined his offer of friendship after all these tests and trials he put him through. After the scuffle at the burning building, Peter returns to his apartment for Thanksgiving dinner with Aunt May, Harry, Mary Jane, and Norman, all arriving to partake in the festivities. Norman discovers Peter's cut and learns about his identity as Spider-Man, forcing him to leave in a hurry and insult Mary Jane in the process. Everybody storms off from Thanksgiving, much to Aunt May's sadness, and Peter rushes after MJ down to the street to apologize for the Osborns' behavior. He gives her a shoulder to cry on, strengthening their bond. 
Now knowing Spider-Man's true identity, Norman struggles with his other personality, vowing to attack Peter's heart by hurting his loved ones. His first victim is of course Aunt May. He destroys her house and hospitalizes her due to the old woman falling into shock. Peter rushes to her bedside and realizes that the goblin knows who he is. Hoping that she'll recover, Peter spends some time next to Aunt May studying for some of his college classes. Mary Jane visits the hospital the next day and sits down to talk with Peter as Aunt May pretends to sleep. MJ reveals to Peter that she doesn't love Harry, and that she's developed a crush on Spider-Man, with Peter explaining he often talks to Spider-Man about her. After hearing Peter's touching statement on her, Mary Jane reaches out and grasps his hand, remembering her true feelings for him. Harry walks in at this very moment to visit Aunt May, and witnesses the compassion between these two. That night, Harry returns home and admits that Norman was right about Mary Jane not loving him. He tells Norman that MJ loves Peter, giving him the idea of attacking her next. He begins looking into Mary Jane's personal life, trying to learn more about her in preparation for the attack. That same night, Peter, now feeling confident as Spider-Man after his interaction with Mary Jane, decides to let Aunt May rest as he heads out into the city for a little bit. He gets ambushed by dozens of Goblin's razor bats and is forced to hide out in a nearby construction site. Spider-Man manages to grab the blade of a razor bat and takes it away to study it. He traces the bat back to Oscorp and believes that Goblin works for the company. He decides to pay an unannounced visit to Oscorp by breaking and entering, where he stealthily sneaks around Oscorp, avoiding security guards and super soldier robots while obtaining codes to a blast door leading into Oscorp's chemical labs. Within the chemical labs, Dr. Antower talks to Dr. Rue about an accidental release of chemical weapons that could potentially lead to many casualties. Spider-Man steps in to question Antower, and the two strike up a partnership to put a stop to the chemical weapons so the city doesn't suffer, and so Goblin doesn't have access to more deadly weapons. Spider-Man is tasked with finding control rooms overseeing chemical injections into the central vat of the chemical division. After activating all four control rooms and beginning the injection process which creates a burnout in the chemicals, Spider-Man travels deeper into Oscorp and stumbles upon an extremely large area housing Oscorp's ultimate weapon. Destroying its generators around its body and around the room, Spider-Man manages to destroy the ultimate weapon which in turn blasts a hole in the wall that he uses to escape. Spider-Man eventually finds Osborne's office and stumbles upon a file containing Mary Jane's pictures and personal information. He puts two and two together, and realizes that if the Green Goblin works at Oscorp, Mary Jane could be a potential victim since she is the girlfriend of Norman's son, and in a way, is connected to himself. Going back the way he came, Oscorp is now aware of Spider-Man's presence and sets the super soldier robots loose to track him down. Deactivating the building's security while dodging security, Spider-Man narrowly escapes Oscorp. After derailing the Chemical Weapons Project, it's most likely that the Chemical Weapons Division of Oscorp went under and all workers, including Dr. Antower and Dr. Rue, lost their jobs. Upon escaping from Oscorp, Peter returns to the hospital where Aunt May is being kept, but conks out from all the stress his body just barely went through. Waking up at her bedside a few hours later, Aunt May reminds Peter about Mary Jane and Peter immediately goes to call her, only for the goblin to pick up on the other end. It's revealed that the goblin found Mary Jane at her apartment and kidnapped her, taking her to the Queensboro Bridge. Spider-Man encounters Goblin on the bridge and the final fight between the two commences as Goblin drops both Mary Jane and a rail car full of children off opposite sides of the bridge. Spidey manages to save MJ and the children, even getting a little help from New York citizens in the process, but the Goblin decides to take the battle somewhere more private. Dragging Spider-Man to a ruined and abandoned hospital, he brutally beats Spider-Man until the hero gains the upper hand and bests Goblin in combat. Revealing his identity as Norman Osborn, everything begins to make sense for Peter as Norman tries distracting him so he can get the jump on him. Dodging the Goblin glider, Peter watches as it impales Norman against a nearby wall and kills him. With the police closing in, Peter decides to take Norman's lifeless body before they can arrive. Taking Norman's body back to his house, Spider-Man is spotted by Harry, who believes that Spider-Man murdered him. With the hero escaping, Harry is emotionally distraught at the loss of his father. The Osborne butler, Bernard, cleans Norman's wounds and discovers that he was killed by his own glider. However, to save the boy further distraught, he decides not to tell Harry the truth at the moment. A few days would pass and the day of Norman's funeral had arrived. Mary Jane returns to her childhood home to tell her father off, standing up for herself after years of verbal and physical abuse. At the funeral, Harry vows that Spider-Man is going to pay for his father's death. 
Peter visits Uncle Ben's grave and is comforted by Mary Jane, who admits her feelings for Peter and kisses him. Unfortunately, Peter declines MJ's advances, not wanting her to get involved with his dangerous life as Spider-Man. But unbeknownst to Peter, Mary Jane recognizes the kiss she had with Peter and compares it to the one that she had with Spider-Man, sparking her suspicion about Peter's true identity. A few days after the funeral is Jameson's birthday, and he is shocked that the city is now seeing Spider-Man as a hero after the fiasco with Green Goblin, despite all of his efforts of painting him as a menace. Life is bittersweet for Peter at the moment, as his time as Spider-Man has now forced him to give up things he thought he had always wanted, but he knew that he had to defend this city as its hero, just in case another threat ever decided to show its face. Over the course of the next two years, Peter Parker declares his physics major at Columbia University and continues to learn about the hardships of having two lives. He begins to struggle juggling his expanding personal life where he occasionally stops in the local comic shops and purchases a rundown scooter for personal usage, whereas with his superhero life, he spends the majority of his time helping citizens of the city with simple tasks and by stopping average everyday crimes. He even snags a police scanner so he can listen in on city activities when at home. During this two-year gap, Peter continues to perfect his skills as Spider-Man and keeps himself entertained day after day by making up races throughout the city to keep himself on his toes, delivering pizzas for his new job at Joe's Pizza, all while continuing to take pictures of himself for the Daily Bugle. During this time, Peter Parker also enlists the Flying Dutchman's tailor who had created his original Spidey outfit to create a newer, updated Spider-Man suit, making slight appearance changes to the original since the original was trashed in the fight against the Green Goblin. With Norman Osborn dead and divisions of the company fluctuating, Harry takes over Oscorp as the head of special projects for the company and maintains his hatred for Spider-Man. He and Peter both leave their shared apartment and begin to live separately, with Peter now living in a rundown apartment where he pays rent to Mr. Ditkovich. It's implied that his daughter Ursula forms a crush on the awkward yet likable Peter Parker. Mary Jane continues pursuing her dreams of becoming an actress and eventually lands the leading role in a play titled The Importance of Being Earnest. It's also implied that during this time, Mary Jane's parents have finally divorced from one another, with her mom having had enough of her father's abusive tendencies. MJ meets John Jameson on her last day at the Moondance Diner. After being harassed by a customer, John stands up for MJ and convinces her to stand up for herself as well as against her boss, which ultimately causes her to lose her job. But in the process, the two start to take a liking to each other and begin to date. Otto Octavius, one of Peter's idols, has been working on sustainable fusion this entire time and is nearing the end of his research, but first he starts developing and ultimately finishes working on a set of mechanical arms that function through an inhibitor chip that can assist him in perfecting his project. He initially got the idea after paying a visit to the Coney Island Aquarium. Craven, Shocker, and Vulture all remain in prison during these two years after their first encounters against Spider-Man. Alexander O'Hearn joins a local, unnamed gang within New York City and is given a large mechanical suit in hopes of using it to steal more government equipment. When in this suit, Alex is known as the Rhino. This suit was most likely created by Jack Albright, a freelance mercenary who would occasionally work with this unnamed gang, known for his incredible talent in creating mechanized equipment. Sometime during these two years, Scorpion discovers Mecha Biocon, a company best known for developing military cybernetics, and he manages to get his suit removed in the Scorpion project, only to have a similar one placed on him later by Dr. Stillwell. This new suit includes mental implants that allow Stillwell to take control of Scorpion if they choose. With Scorpion under mind control slavery, he is often assigned into performing various illegal missions for Mecha Biocon. Dr. Jessica begins working at MBC and is assigned to the Scorpion Project. The already schizophrenic Mac Gargan undergoes further mental breakdowns due to his experiences at MBC, with Jessica being the only scientist showing compassion towards him. In the midst of Columbia University's 2004 spring semester, Kurt Connors invites Otto Octavius as a guest speaker for one of his class's lectures. The two friends catch up and even talk about one of Kurt's most brilliant yet laziest students, Peter Parker. A mechanical robot piloted by Jack Albright, the mercenary known for creating equipment for Rhino's gang, attacks both Kurt and Otto on campus, taking Otto hostage. Spider-Man steps in and quickly defeats the robot, saving Otto and taking Jack off to interrogate him. Jack reveals that he kidnapped Otto, hoping to learn more about the arms that Otto had created, and how he could potentially weaponize them. 
Jack pulls out a cigarette and tries to blow it up in Spider-Man's face, but this backfires and sets Jack ablaze. In a frenzy, he falls off of the roof and Spider-Man tries to save him, but is unable to reach him fast enough, not being able to learn more about these supposed arms. Some time passes from this event until John Jameson takes Mary Jane out on a fancy lunch date where he plans on introducing her to his father, J. Jonah Jameson. JJ and MJ warm up to each other over their bold attitudes, even going far enough to debate over what truly defines a hero and whether or not Spider-Man can be considered one. Later on, Spider-Man is out on patrol, swinging throughout the city by a local comic shop he frequently visits, only to notice a few muggers robbing a nearby arcade. Taking off with their car, Spidey stops the car and returns the stolen items to the arcade owner. After taking care of these simple crimes as of late, Spider-Man points out that the city has been relatively quiet, hoping that his luck has changed. Spidey continues his patrol, swinging past Otto's apartment where he continues his work on Fusion, nearing its completion. A few weeks pass and Peter is late for work at Joe's Pizza. He's forced to travel 42 blocks in 7.5 minutes in order to guarantee Joe's company promise, or else he's fired from the job. On his way to deliver the pizzas, he notices a few kids chasing a ball into the street with an oncoming truck barreling towards them. Spider-Man swoops in to save the kids and then resumes his delivery, but unfortunately he arrives just a few minutes too late and thus the customer doesn't pay. Pizza time. After being fired from Joe's Pizza, Peter heads over to the Daily Bugle to deliver Spider-Man pictures to Jameson, but his paycheck sadly doesn't cover the advance that Betty gave to him a while back. At this point in his life, Peter's down on his luck and his double life as Spider-Man is starting to catch up to him. Leaving the bugle, Peter realizes that he's late for Dr. Connors' class and swings over to Columbia University. On his way towards campus, Peter overhears a gang attempting to steal a suspicious briefcase from a woman, so he steps in and stops them, returning the briefcase to its owner. Questioning what's inside, Spider-Man doesn't get any answers, but it's implied that there's something very valuable, or possibly even government-related, inside. Switching back to his civilian clothes, Peter returns to campus and runs into Dr. Connors, being reminded of his absence from class, and that his paper on Fusion is overdue. That night, Peter arrives at Aunt May's house and runs into a surprise party for his 21st birthday. Peter catches up with Harry and MJ, feeling a distinct lack of chemistry between them in comparison to what he had several years prior, with Harry blaming Spider-Man for his father's death, and MJ being interested in someone else, unbeknownst to Peter. Harry offers Peter the chance to personally meet one of his idols, Otto Octavius, giving Peter the chance to finish his overdue paper. After the party is over, Peter finds a foreclosure notice on May's house and tries to reach out to her, but instead of accepting his help, Aunt May gives Peter money instead. The two reminisce over Uncle Ben's death, however there is a tiny continuity error here, as Aunt May states that it'll be two years next month when Ben was killed. But we know that he was killed before Peter's graduation, and now we're in August celebrating his birthday. So for this timeline, it's actually closer to two and a half years. After feeling guilty for not admitting responsibility over Ben's death, Peter cleans up trash from the party and decides to take it out, where he encounters Mary Jane, who decided to stick around her childhood home. The two personally catch up some more, with MJ inviting Peter to an upcoming play the next day, ending with her telling him that she started dating someone else, much to Peter's disappointment. Wanting to make it up to her, Peter promises that he'll make it to her play, and MJ heads off to go pick up his special tickets. Upon returning to his rundown apartment, the money that Aunt May had given Peter is taken directly by Mr. Ditkovich for rent. Despite being exhausted, Peter tunes into his police scanner and takes a little break before heading back into the night on patrol. Later on in the night when on patrol, Peter meets up again with MJ who has picked up some special tickets for him regarding her upcoming play. In the midst of their extended conversation, Peter notices some figures sneaking into a nearby art gallery and is forced to ditch MJ in order to go stop it. Upon entering and stopping the art thieves, Spider-Man encounters Black Cat for the first time. She escapes and he chases after her thinking she's part of the crew, however she manages to get the drop on him and escapes. The next morning, Peter heads to the Daily Bugle and learns about Quentin Beck publicly calling Spider-Man a fraud. Irritated by this statement, Peter is given a task by Robbie to take pictures of the entire city, to which Peter takes them on top of the Empire State Building, venting about Beck's claims. Peter returns to the Bugle and delivers the photos to Robbie at an alarming rate, perhaps sparking Robbie's suspicions of Peter being Spider-Man. 
After leaving the Bugle, Peter overhears commotion on a nearby street and rushes off to encounter the Rhino and a few members of the gang who tried stealing the lady's briefcase the other day. The gang is attempting to steal an important piece of fragile equipment, it's never identified farther than this, but Rhino fights Spider-Man and is quickly defeated, with the equipment being destroyed in the process as he's left for the cops. A short while after this, Peter meets up with Harry who introduces him to Otto Octavius for the first time. The two bond over their high intelligence, and Peter is invited to eat lunch with him and his wife, Rosie. Speaking from personal experience, Otto convinces Peter to feed Mary Jane poetry if he wants her to fall in love with him, and he's also invited to Otto's demonstration of the Fusion Project the next day. After lunch with Otto, Peter decides to stop back in at the Daily Bugle, only to learn that Beck has now publicly challenged Spider-Man at a nearby sports arena to actually prove that he's a fake. Spider-Man heads to the arena and beats all of Beck's challenges with ease, but in the process, the Shocker manages to escape custody after being used as a pawn for one of Beck's challenges. Now, I wanted to point out that Beck's gauntlet of challenges takes place the morning after Mary Jane's play, but for the sake of timeline continuity, I decided to push it back to now, the evening before. It doesn't change much, if anything at all, and actually makes more sense considering it's a televised event and more people would be able to watch it in the evening as opposed to the morning. Anyways, now that Beck has been publicly humiliated by Spider-Man, he decides to move on to Plan B in order to take vengeance back on the Web Slinger. Afterwards, Peter heads to the laundromat that night in order to study some poetry books he picked up while he does his laundry in preparation for Mary Jane's play that same night. On his way home to prepare for the play, Spider-Man overhears an alarm at a jewelry store and he runs into Black Cat once again. He chases after her once more, but she manages to slip out of his grasp again, but not before revealing her name to him. Awestruck at Black Cat, Peter loses track of time and quickly returns to his apartment, getting ready for MJ's play. All seems well and good as he drives his scooter towards the theater, but he nearly gets run over by a few carjackers being chased by the police. As Spider-Man, he puts a stop to the chase and ends up late for the play. Typical Parker luck for his night to be ruined. He still attempts to catch the end of the show, but the theater's usher won't let him break the show's illusion. Thus, Peter is forced to sit outside and listen to a citizen playing an off-tune version of the 1960s Spider-Man theme. Once the play is over and everyone is leaving, Peter catches a glimpse of John Jameson walking up to and kissing Mary Jane through the crowd. He knew that MJ was seeing someone, but that initial pain was too much to bear, so he runs off and suits up as Spider-Man, going off to sulk. Black Cat steps in and informs him that she found a lead on the group of thieves who were robbing the art gallery the other night. Deciding it would be a good distraction, Spider-Man follows after her and the two stop a back alley heist, but with his back turned, Black Cat runs off with the golden sculpture the gang was stealing. After not only seeing Mary Jane kiss someone else, but also having Cat, a supposed new love interest, deceive him, Peter swings off in anger, but loses control of his powers. He crash lands on top of a rooftop and is forced to take an awkward elevator ride down to the bottom. The next morning, Peter heads to class, but he just can't seem to pay any attention as he begins sketching some pictures. Afterwards, his guilt gets the best of him and he calls Mary Jane trying to apologize for missing the play. He even contemplates telling her about his identity, but chooses not to. Later in the day, Peter heads to Otto's demonstration where at first, it seems that Otto's life goal of sustaining fusion has finally been realized thanks to the revelation of his mechanical arms, the very same arms that Jack Albright had been talking about. Unfortunately, just as quick, the demonstration goes wrong and ends with Rosie being struck down dead, Harry being shamed after the project's failure, and Otto being knocked unconscious, fused to his robotic arms. Stepping in as Spider-Man, Peter manages to shut down the fusion reactor, but not without the damage already being done. He leaves the scene of the crime and begins thinking about Otto and Rosie non-stop, so in order to take his mind off of them, he returns to work at the Daily Bugle. Peter learns that Quentin Beck is back at it again, hosting a press conference that night at 8 o'clock. Jameson sends Peter off to the conference as a photographer, but before he arrives, the conference is attacked by a new menace named Mysterio. Spider-Man steps in and rescues the different reporters, defeating Mysterio's alien robots in the process. Revealing his plan to attack the Statue of Liberty, the hologram of Mysterio disappears, and Spider-Man quickly heads over to Lady Liberty in order to put a stop to the quote-unquote UFO invasion. 
With the entire attack being revealed as an illusion, Spider-Man tracks down Mysterio's fortress and faces off against different trials in his funhouse of doom, with all of it also seeming to be a more realistic illusion. After fighting Funhouse mirror versions of himself and finding his way out, Mysterio promises that he will return, leaving Spider-Man with no further leads on his whereabouts. Later that night, Otto is taken to the hospital and surgeons try to surgically remove his metal arms. Sadly though, the inhibitor chip for the arms had been destroyed from the fusion reactor, and thus the arms were beginning to take over Otto's mind. The arms were somehow speaking to him, convincing him that they were like children to him, the children that he never had. The arms take over and attack the surgeons, killing all of them. Otto escapes, throws a few cars, and escapes to rebuild his project in an abandoned portside warehouse. The next day, Peter realizes that he is late for a meeting with Doc Connors and heads over towards his campus, but he gets attacked by more of Mysterio's robots. Annoyed that this lunatic just keeps coming back, Spider-Man defeats the robots. However, at the exact same time, Otto Octavius, having gathered some clothing and composure from his hospital escape, seeks help from Kurt Connors, but he ends up attacking him instead. He blames Spider-Man for the death of Rosie, and for his experiment being ruined, leaving an injured Kurt behind. After dealing with the robots, Peter stumbles upon an injured Dr. Connors and seeks medical attention, but not before Kurt shouts out Otto's name. Confused by this, Peter heads back to the Daily Bugle, where Jameson name drops Dr. Octopus as the Bugle begins to look into him and his crimes. They were gonna call him Dr. Strange, but sadly, that name was taken. Jameson gives Peter the task of taking pictures of his son at the planetarium tomorrow night for a charity event, much against his will. But considering he needs the money, Peter accepts the job and leaves to go meet Aunt May at her bank. After Kurt was of no help to him, Otto heads to the exact same bank in order to steal money for his project. Peter and Aunt May are currently there trying to use Uncle Ben's life insurance to refinance May's home, but she gets declined. Otto attacks the bank and forces Peter to step in as Spider-Man, leading to Aunt May being taken hostage. The two fight for the first time, resulting in Otto's escape and Spider-Man's rescue of Aunt May, giving her more of a positive image of the hero. After this, back as Peter Parker, Aunt May is reunited with her nephew back at the bank, and from this point forward, it's implied that she's also starting to suspect that Peter is Spider-Man. Returning to the Bugle to deliver pictures of the action at the bank, Peter also learns that someone had busted several supervillains out of Riker's prison in the midst of all the chaos ensuing between Otto's project and Mysterio's invasion. Jameson gives Peter another task of visiting the Wax Museum that night to take more pictures. Peter, of course, takes on this extra job. Heading to the Wax Museum that night, Peter runs into a hostage situation orchestrated by Mysterio. Spider-Man goes through another set of Mysterio's challenges, saving hostages along the way, and leaves Mysterio for the police. However, in the PSP version of the game, this is actually Mysterio's physical body, but to avoid any plot holes, let's just say it was a robotic fake that the police found, as we know that Mysterio has experience with robotics. The next day, Peter stumbles upon a bomb when out on patrol and alerts the NYPD as well as the Daily Bugle. He heads around the city disarming more bombs, theorizing that this is the work of one of the escaped supervillains from Rikers. He traces the bombs back to Vulture. Tracking Vulture down, Spider-Man defeats him much easier this time around in comparison to their first match, leading to Vulture giving information about Shocker offering him work. However, he was cast out of the crew by Shocker when Rhino busted them out of jail. Leaving Vulture for the police, Spider-Man pushes Shocker and Rhino towards the back of his mind, hoping to get more information on their whereabouts later on. That night at the planetarium, Harry tries to get drunk to cope with the loss of his funding for Otto's project, and his reputation now being in shambles after the man's conversion into a criminal. In a drunken rage, Harry gets into a slapping match with Peter, putting a large strain on their friendship. However, Peter's main concern tonight is the revelation that Mary Jane's boyfriend was actually John Jameson, the son of JJ, adding even more salt to his wounds. Peter tries to reach out and talk to Mary Jane, but he indirectly pushes her farther away, and out of spite, she agrees to John's marriage proposal. When this engagement is publicly announced, Peter is in utter shock at just how far his life has fallen. Heading out into the night as Spider-Man, Peter tries to push away the thoughts of Mary Jane's engagement with John as Black Cat steps in to cheer him up. She reveals she took the statue to the cops and was only trying to push his buttons. At this point, Peter didn't really care and could only think about Mary Jane. 
but then Kat gives him some prime information that he was needing to hear at that moment. Revealing Shocker's whereabouts, the two track him down to a warehouse and proceed to fight him and his newly equipped goons. The two bond over this duel against Shocker, and it looks like Peter was starting to let go of his initial disappointment with Mary Jane. Shocker ultimately gets away after blindsiding Black Cat. After her injury, Black Cat decides to take some time to herself and parts ways with Spider-Man. Deciding to follow up on Shocker on his own to keep himself busy, Spider-Man tracks him alongside Rhino down to a separate warehouse where the two are defeated quite easily due to their sloppy teamwork. Shocker reveals that they were hired by Doc Ock to steal secret government equipment, most likely to help build his project better than from what it was at the demonstration. Spider-Man leaves Rhino and Shocker for the cops, only for the both of them to get loose from his webs, splitting apart and going their separate ways. Peter returns home exhausted from all the action, not quite over Mary Jane's engagement, but he's way too tired to feel upset. The next morning, Peter is called into the Bugle to take some pictures of a Latvian diplomat. However, on his way to take said pictures, Peter overhears about supposed alien invaders robbing a local Speedy Mart. Confronting Mysterio once more, Spider-Man knocks him out with a single punch, revealing that Quentin Beck was actually Mysterio all along. Webbing him up for the cops, Spider-Man snaps a picture of Beck and returns those pictures back to Jameson, believing them to be more newsworthy than the diplomat, only for him to claim that Mysterio and Spider-Man were both in cahoots this whole time. Sick and tired of Jameson's constant slander, Spider-Man reaches out to help a citizen in need only for them to run off in fear due to his tainted image from the Bugle's claims. At this point in time, Peter is a bit more hasty with his emotions and decides to go confront Jameson as Spider-Man once and for all. However, Black Cat intervenes and steers him off before he can make a rash decision. Hoping to cheer Spidey up, the two relocate Shocker at an old Oscorp research lab on Roosevelt Island, now off on his own after splitting apart from Rhino. The two of them track Shocker down and fight him, defeating him with relative ease. After they leave Shocker for the cops, it's implied that due to how much time they've spent together, Spider-Man is starting to develop feelings for Black Cat, but is still conflicted due to his love for Mary Jane. Afterwards, Peter remembers Mary Jane starring in another showing of her play, and this time, he was hoping to try and catch the end of it to make up for the past several nights. However, upon arriving late, as usual, he manages to save her from a couple of muggers. MJ reunites with Spider-Man, but rather than kissing him in the rain like last time, she tells him about her marriage, bringing pain back into Peter's heart. He leaves Mary Jane and decides to go find Black Cat, hoping that she can cheer him up like she did in the past few nights. Finding her on top of the Chrysler building, Spider-Man has a chat with Black Cat, who tries convincing him that he's one of the most important men in the world due to his powers, so he should just give up being Peter Parker entirely. At this point, Peter is super conflicted and is going through a minor identity crisis. He wants to please Black Cat by continuing to run around as Spider-Man, but he also wants to be there for Mary Jane as Peter. He just doesn't know how to balance both. Before Peter has much time to think, Black Cat gives him another lead on criminal activities, and the two race to a warehouse on the opposite end of the city. The two stumble upon a large gathering of members from Rhino's gang bidding off mech suits similar to the one Jack Albright was wearing when he kidnapped Otto. Putting all of the pieces together, Spider-Man figures out that whatever this gang was after within that woman's briefcase from several days ago was tied to blueprints relating to these mech suits, and now that Jack Albright was dead, these suits were harder to come by, so this gang needed the blueprints to make more. Cat alerts the gang of their presence, forcing the two crime fighters to put a quick stop to this bidding war when Spider-Man would have rather taken things slower and more stealthily. The two argue about their differences, causing Black Cat to run off in annoyance. Spider-Man follows after her to apologize, and tries telling her that he just can't live the same lifestyle as her. He tells her he has to have that balance of a personal life and a superhero life, because he can't give up either. Cat understands, and the two decide to remain friends. She encourages him to go after Mary Jane instead. Now confident that he can try and handle both lives, Peter immediately runs off to MJ's apartment, hoping to finally spill both his feelings and secrets to her. However, much to Peter's sadness, MJ is adamant about marrying John and declines all of his advances. With his confidence being shot down and Black Cat now out of the picture, Peter decides to try and take a relaxing nighttime swing to try and calm his mind, but he loses his powers yet again as he slams down into a nearby alleyway. 
Unsure as to what's happening to him, Peter spots a nearby Daily Bugle paper in the trash. It was a printing from a few days ago that tried painting him as a menace that robbed the Manhattan Bank alongside Doc Ock. In disbelief all the way back to his apartment, Peter angrily throws the paper away and finally decides to call it a night. Meanwhile, Otto is still working on his project, utilizing US government equipment that he both managed to pay for and steal thanks to the help of Shocker and Rhino. However, he needs one final component to complete the project, Tritium. The next day, Mary Jane is out shoe shopping with her actress friend, Louise Wood, who is named in the novelization of the movie. Louise questions if MJ actually loves John, or if she just said yes just to say yes, and the two have a heavy debate over love. Meanwhile, Peter decides to pay a visit to student health services on his campus, hoping to figure out why he's losing his powers. Turns out, it's just due to a high level of stress and lack of confidence. That night, he flashes back to the last meeting he had with Uncle Ben, and internally struggles with his choice to keep his double lives. Peter ultimately decides that to truly be happy, he has to give up being Spider-Man, and thus, after throwing his costume away, Spider-Man is no more. Found in the trash a few days later, the Spider-Man suit is found and brought to the Daily Bugle, with the Garbage Man hoping to claim a reward. Jameson takes the suit off of his hands, excited about his new prize, and he even goes far enough to wear it around the office every now and then. For about a month, Peter goes about normal daily life, making up for everything he couldn't savor and enjoy when he was Spider-Man, such as eating hot dogs, fixing up old bicycles, and even performing better in his college classes. However, one day, Peter stumbles upon a mugging in an alleyway and his initial gut feeling is to step in and help, but he decides not to and contemplates if he made the right choice in giving up Spider-Man. Later on, Peter visits Uncle Ben's grave with Aunt May and he decides to finally make the step into living a normal life with her. Peter admits to being responsible for Uncle Ben's death and goes on to tell her most of the details of that fateful night, shocking May tremendously. She makes Peter feel alienated for this moment. That same night, Otto pays a visit to Harry requesting more tritium. Harry offers a trade where he'll give the tritium to Otto if he can capture Spider-Man and bring him back to the Osborne Mansion alive. Otto agrees and heads off to locate Peter Parker, who has information on Spidey's whereabouts. Meanwhile, after relieving the stress of telling Aunt May the truth and after facing the consequences of her disappointment, Peter stumbles upon a burning building and decides to go in and save a little girl who is trapped inside. Without his powers though, Peter has a much harder time surviving the fire, but he saves the girl and is congratulated by everyone outside. However, he couldn't save everyone, as someone was still trapped inside when the building fell. The next morning, guilt continues to dig into Peter as he knew that if he was still Spider-Man, he could have saved everyone in that building. These past few weeks have been filled with nothing but grief until a shimmer of hope shines through for Peter in the form of cake delivered to him by Ursula. The two share a moment of bliss and Peter is truly appreciative of Ursula's kindness to him. After receiving a call from Aunt May, Peter returns to her home and discovers that she's moving, despite being given a two weeks notice on her foreclosure. It turns out that with a little time, May decided to forgive Peter because she's always loved him and she even gives him a pep talk about what truly defines a hero, giving Peter that final piece of motivation that he needed. Testing his powers, Peter realizes that he needs to work his way back up to being Spider-Man as opposed to expecting them to magically reappear. That night, Mary Jane and John are planning their wedding, with MJ going through the registry while John plans for their honeymoon. In the movie, we see MJ hold up a little card that lists the date April 26th, which does match up with Uncle Ben's death date, but it's inconsistent with Peter's birthday being in August, and the fact that leaves have started falling off the trees by this point, signifying that it's around fall. John brings up the idea that maybe they're rushing into this wedding a bit too quick, and MJ feels the same, deciding to take her friend's advice and see if she truly loved John or not. She leans his head back and kisses him in the same fashion as when she kissed Spider-Man and realizes that there just isn't the same spark. She decides to call up Peter and meet him the next day, hoping to feel that same spark that she felt at Norman's funeral. When the two meet up that next day, MJ tries to kiss Peter, but he declines her advances due to him getting back into the groove of becoming Spider-Man. What unfortunate timing. Otto steps in and takes Mary Jane hostage, threatening Peter into contacting Spider-Man and having him meet up with him. With this, Peter gets that final burst of energy back into obtaining all of his powers. But first, before he confronts Otto, he has to steal his costume back from Jameson. 
Tracking him down at a clock tower across the city, Spider-Man confronts Doc Ock and the two tumble down onto a train where their fight kicks up significantly, with both sides constantly bouncing around all sides of the moving vehicle, throwing themselves at one another as passengers watch in shock. Realizing this fight isn't going anywhere, Otto decides to destroy the brakes on the train and forces Spider-Man to try and stop the train himself. With all of his strength, Peter manages to strain himself long enough to slow the train down to a halt before the passengers are killed, and he passes out from the immense work he put into doing so. The passengers pull Peter back into the train and praise Spider-Man for saving their lives, vowing to keep his identity a secret. They even go far enough to defend him from Doc Ock, who ends up capturing him. Otto delivers the body of Spider-Man to Harry, who as promised, gives him the tritium. Taking a dagger, Harry plans on killing Spider-Man once and for all, but before doing so, rips off his mask to discover his best friend, the person he trusted most, was actually the quote-unquote murderer of his father this whole time. Conflicted by this revelation, Harry lets Peter live, and even tells him where Otto is keeping Mary Jane. Spider-Man tracks Doc Ock down to his lair and proceeds to confront him one more time, however his mask is removed during their battle, and Mary Jane finally discovers the identity of Spider-Man. Her suspicions about Peter were correct all along, and everything is now making sense. During their battle, Doc Ock's arms begin to malfunction, and he slowly starts to regain control of his mind. Otto realizes that his hubris led to his downfall, and that this time, he took his dream way too far with Peter giving him that same pep talk that Aunt May had given him. Accepting what his life has become, Otto sacrifices himself to drown the fusion reactor in the river, giving Peter and MJ time to escape. Meanwhile, Harry starts to struggle mentally after the revelation of Peter's identity as Spider-Man. He begins to see hallucinations of his father, who tries convincing him to follow in his footsteps. But Harry is conflicted on what to do, and in a fit of rage, discovers the old goblin lair his father has hidden behind his mirror. Afterwards, with the police arriving on scene, Peter and Mary Jane have a heart-to-heart -heart chat, where the two decide that they just can't be together, or else she'll be put in constant danger. The two don't see each other for a few days, and the day of Mary Jane's wedding finally arrives. Getting cold feet, Mary Jane gets a pep talk from her mother, and surprisingly her father, to pursue her true happiness and go after the one that she truly loves, who they both know is Peter Parker, who is absent from her wedding. Ditching John at the altar, Mary Jane runs off towards Peter's apartment, where the two admit their love for each other and accept the challenges that the future may throw their way. With this, the two are officially a couple. After finally getting the girl of his dreams, life for Peter Parker seems to balance itself out, and all of those hardships he had to face recently were just tribulations he had to endure to finally get that satisfaction of peace that he had always wanted. However, this peace didn't last long, as several months after the death of Otto Octavius, Calypso arrives in New York City, hoping to break her lover, Craven, out of Riker's prison, who has been in prison the entire time since his encounter with Spider-Man. Somewhere along the line, she encounters Spider-Man himself and attempts to strike him down out of revenge for her lover, but she loses and is forced to retreat, with her and Craven leaving New York for the time being, planning on returning. Also, I didn't include it anywhere on the timeline, but if you want to include the events of Spider-Man 2's PC video game, it only makes sense for the events of that game to serve as a fever dream for Peter whenever he's sick or something. But that's up for you to decide, I just didn't include it. During this time of peace, Peter returns to taking on low-level crime, as there are no longer any super-powered individuals running around the Big Apple. Peter manages to finish his first few years of university and now has the encouragement of Mary Jane to continue on towards graduation. Not only has his personal life significantly improved, but he finally decided to improve his public image in the city by doing PR work to make himself a more friendly icon in the eyes of the public. At this point in time, Peter's life begins to shift from the dark pit it was in with everyone and everything being out to get him, with the city now beginning to see him in a brighter light for once, despite all the claims Jameson makes at the Daily Bugle. Life is going great for both Peter Parker and Mary Jane. For Harry Osborn, however, now knowing that Peter is Spider-Man, he starts spending most of his time learning more about his father's role as the Green Goblin, all while mentally struggling with the legacy that his father left behind. Peter would spend many months trying to get into contact with Harry, hoping to patch their friendship, but he has no luck, and decides that Harry needs to be willing to hear the truth, rather than be forced. 
Sometime during this time period, Rhino is discovered by Mecha Biocon after he broke off from Shocker and is given a new suit. He begins working under Dr. Stillwell, similar to what Scorpion has been doing this entire time. Black Cat is still active within the city, but Spider-Man begins seeing her less and less after he got with Mary Jane, almost as if she was purposely trying to stay out of his life. Aunt May moves out of her house that she and Ben raised Peter in, and into an apartment complex. Dr. Kurt Connors begins developing a regeneration serum based off of his study of lizards, hoping to regrow the missing arm that he lost overseas. New gangs begin popping up within the city, with the most notable being the Apocalypse, Arsenic Candies, and Dragon Tails gangs. The three of them begin dividing up New York, and constantly participate in turf wars that Spider-Man steps in and stops. It's not quite on the same level as a supervillain, but these turf wars do keep Spidey busy. While in prison due to his involvement with the Ben Parker homicide, Flint Marco begins writing to a man named Dr. Ralph Wallace, a talented doctor who has spent years researching the rare disease that Penny inherited from a young age. The two constantly write back and forth with Wallace trying to convince Flint that he needs funding and the money he was given just wasn't enough to help Penny. Luke Carlyle has been a wealthy businessman up until J. Jonah Jameson started writing incriminating articles in the Daily Bugle about his company, leading the city into investigating his activities. After discovering that his factories have been causing mass pollution, the authorities shut his business down and ultimately send Luke Carlyle into financial freefall, leading to him becoming the villain known as the Mad Bomber. Carlisle would go on to hire a bunch of henchmen that would later form into the H-Bombers gang, and he begins planning a bombing spree around the city as payback to the man who ruined his image. Afterwards, Flint Marco likely escapes from Riker's prison for the first time, and tries to lay low under the law with no family to return to. Still wanted for the crimes he committed, but still determined to find money for his daughter's illness. A little under a year has passed since the death of Otto Octavius, and Peter has been dating Mary Jane steadily for this entire time. He begins to think about asking her to marry him, and went out on a swing around the city, performing his daily routine of saving civilians and stopping runaway trucks. He worries about whether or not he would be able to financially support MJ as a wife. During his patrol, Peter gets a few signs indicating that he should go forth with asking her to marry him, and thus, he decides to go out and find a ring. Meanwhile, Flint Marco is out on the street reminiscing of the good old times he used to have working under Johnny O, the high point of his life. With his daughter getting more sick with each passing day, Flint is desperate to find a job more than ever in order to support her. But he quickly falls back into his old habits and resorts to robbing a nearby jewelry store, which just so happens to be the exact same one Peter is currently in. However, much to Flint's misfortune, there were already two robbers inside trying to make a quick buck, and with Spider-Man webbing them up, the cops have already been alerted. By the time Flint works up the courage to go inside and hold the store up, the cops are already there and they quickly detain him, sending him right back to Riker's prison. Having completed his recruitment of the H-Bombers, and after finalizing his bombing spree plan, Luke Carlyle sets his sights on his former office building, the Carlyle Building. With the building set ablaze and hostages being left inside, Spider-Man steps in and rescues Carlisle's former employees within the building. The next day, Spider-Man decides to look into the perpetrators of the bombing and locates an informant on the H-Bombers, learning that the gang had stolen power converters, an industrial prototype, and have been hiring themselves out as corporate mercenaries all to help Carlisle in his corporate sabotage. Spider-Man locates more evidence on the H-Bombers and delivers it to the police, who in turn take said evidence to the district attorney to initiate further investigations into this new gang. Peter heads to the Daily Bugle hoping Jameson puts a photographer on this case, and while there, overhears a phone call from the Mad Bomber informing Jameson that he had planted bombs at all of the Bugle offices in the city, along with a multitude of bombs underground. Heading to the Bugle's printing plant and the regional office first, Spider-Man disarms all of the bombs and informs the bomb squad of other bomb locations. Afterwards, he races down into the subway system underneath Grand Central Station and deactivates all of the bombs placed underground, stopping a runaway train in the process. That same night, Spider-Man is on his way home after the averted bombing incidents but gets alerted to a discreet location by Detective Gene DeWolf of the NYPD. Requesting his help to investigate an arms deal with the Dragon Tails gang since he's allowed to operate without needing a warrant, the two strike up a partnership and put a stop to the arms deal. Spider-Man apprehends the Dragon Tails gang leader. 
A few days pass and Kurt Connors finishes his regeneration serum, using it on himself hoping to regrow his lost arm, all while recording the process. Unfortunately, the serum goes terribly wrong and he transforms into the monstrous lizard. Retaining his human intelligence, the lizard escapes Connors' lab and begins using the serum on citizens around the city in order to create more lizard people. The next morning, Peter arrives at the Daily Bugle, being told by Jameson to go down to Central Park and take pictures of giant lizards running rampant. After taking said pictures, Spider-Man manages to rescue a few civilians from being kidnapped by these lizards before they could be taken and turned into lizards themselves. Peter returns the photos to the Bugle and decides to head to Dr. Connors' lab about the growing lizard situation, knowing that he has a background in studying the species. Stumbling into his destroyed lab, Peter finds the footage that Connors had left during his transformation into the lizard. Unbeknownst to Peter though, the lizard had actually returned to the lab to retrieve more dosages of the serum and is in that room with him, only to escape into the city. Changing into his Spider-Man suit, Peter chases the lizard throughout the city and into the sewers, where he stumbles upon innocent people being turned into more of these lizard monsters. Fighting them off, Spidey eventually catches up to the lizard, who sets an underground drill loose after him. After escaping the drill, Spider-Man confronts the lizard inside of his den, where their fight continues. The lizard tries releasing more lizard people into the city, but Spider-Man foils that plan and the lizard is forced to escape deeper into the waters of the sewer. With no leads on the lizard's location and no way of following after him, Peter returns to his regular routine of interfering with gangs in the city. He apprehends the leader of the Apocalypse Gang during this time. Some time passes and Spider-Man meets back up with Jean DeWolf, who informs him about her suspicions of dirty cops within the NYPD, letting him know the time and location of a business meeting between these crooked cops and the Arsenic Candy Gang. She requests Spider-Man to step in and get some evidence that can incriminate all those involved. Spider-Man heads to the meeting and gathers enough evidence apprehending the Arsenic Candy Gang leader in the process. Another few days pass and Spider-Man meets up with Jean DeWolf again to discuss the Mad Bomber, with the investigation of the H-Bombers being fully underway by this point. Spider-Man overhears about some activity going on at the George Washington Bridge and heads over to it where he confronts the H-Bombers and defuses some bombs they planted all around the bridge. Meanwhile, Luke Carlisle bombs a nearby chemical plant which leads Spider-Man to him with his identity of Luke Carlisle being revealed. The next morning, Carlisle enacts the final stage of his plan for payback by attacking the Daily Bugle's main office and kidnapping Jameson. Spider-Man steps in and saves his co-workers who were caught in the attack, defusing bombs set up around the building, and proceeds to chase after Jameson in the bomber's black helicopter. Carlisle places an electric collar on Jameson and throws him out of the helicopter, with the collar set to explode if it gets too far from its detonator. Making sure that this doesn't happen, Spider-Man catches Jameson and follows after the helicopter to confront the Mad Bomber. Spider-Man manages to remove the shot collar from Jameson, who awkwardly tries thanking him for his rescue, but states that it's not going to affect his negative statements in the paper. With Jameson now safe, Spider-Man chases after the Mad Bomber and finally defeats him. Luke Carlisle is then imprisoned and thanks to the evidence that Spider-Man had initially collected from the different bombings, the H-Bomber gang begins to dissipate and eventually goes extinct. The next day, DeWolf gets an anonymous invitation to a business meeting and contacts a meetup to inform Spider-Man about it that evening. She decides to head to the meeting and has Spider-Man accompany her as backup in case things get ugly. During the meeting, Spidey tries to capture evidence on the dirty cops, but the plan goes awry and DeWolf gets shoved into a cop car that someone tries driving off of a nearby dock. Putting a stop to the car and rescuing DeWolf before it can hit the water, there's now more than enough evidence against those corrupt officers who just tried to murder her. She goes on to tell Spidey that the department now has the potential to be looked into and cleaned up for good due to their great teamwork and evidence collecting. Meanwhile, Scorpion, who has been working for Mecha Biocon all this time against his will, is enlisted by Dr. Stilwell to do another job. That night, Scorpion is sent to release the Rhino from a police van. Jessica, a worker for Mecha Biocon, arrives on the scene in a van and picks up Scorpion just as Spider-Man arrives on the scene, recognizing Scorpion from that duel that they had years ago. Knowing about a facility set up in the bay that Mecha Biocon created a few years ago, Spider-Man decides to pay them a visit and realizes that the company is using Scorpion as a weapon. Sneaking into MBC, Spider-Man stumbles upon Jessica, the worker who picked Scorpion up in the van, confronting Dr. Stilwell about sending him out and putting his life at risk. 
With Jessica getting emotionally involved with the experiment, Stillwell takes her off of the Scorpion project. Following after Jessica, Spidey forms a partnership with her to free Scorpion from Stillwell's corrupt experiments, but learns that he's been transferred to a separate facility. The company goes on lockdown, and Spider-Man escapes the facility. Later that night, Spidey locates the other facility and breaks into it, locating Scorpion who in turn pleads for help. Upon releasing Scorpion from his restraints, a nearby scientist activates the mind control beam on Scorpion's suit and forces him to attack Spider-Man. The fight escapes out into the city, and Spidey is forced to chase Scorpion. Chasing him onto a nearby bridge, Spider-Man helps Scorpion break his mind control, allowing him to come to his senses. Now free from NBC's control, Scorpion plans to settle the score with Stillwell, but Spider-Man tells him to lay low for a while and hit them when they least expect it. Scorpion decides to lay low in his old bomb shelter hideout until the time comes to attack. Some time passes and Peter has had absolutely no luck in finding an engagement ring that fits his price range. Work at the Bugle has been pretty stagnant for Peter, with nothing of interest going on as of late, and it doesn't really help that a rival photographer, Edward Brock Jr., is hired onto the Daily Bugle staff as another freelance photographer. One week would pass and Peter manages to go see Mary Jane in her new play, Manhattan Memories, where she is listed in one of the leading roles. Unbeknownst to him, Harry also attends the same play to support MJ and to spy on Peter from one of the upper balconies. Once the play is over, Peter spots Harry for the first time in months and tries confronting him, hoping to explain that he didn't kill his father. But Harry doesn't listen and still holds that grudge. Harry leaves without hesitation, much to Peter's disappointment, and returns home, finally deciding to inject the goblin formula into himself. This same night, Eddie Brock encounters Gwen Stacy, daughter of Captain Stacy and lab partner to Peter Parker, in a Starbucks located up on Columbia University's campus. The two begin talking to one another over a cup of coffee, and Eddie ultimately takes Gwen home that night, where the two kiss. Despite Gwen not feeling any attraction towards Eddie, he begins to obsess over her and believes the two are now a couple. After the play, Peter and Mary Jane head to Central Park to lay in a hammock made out of webbing so they can watch the stars. Sharing a kiss, neither of the two spot a falling meteorite land near Peter's scooter, and as the two prepare to leave, a mysterious black goo emerges from the meteorite, attaching itself to the scooter. Meanwhile, Flint Marco is seen fleeing from a police car after escaping Rikers in the midst of a prison riot. He manages to escape their sights and returns to his former apartment, where he slips a few unsent letters under his sick daughter's pillow. Changing out of his prison clothing and into regular clothing, Flint is caught by Emma, who berates him for showing back up into their lives. The argument causes Penny to wake up, and she walks in to see her father for the first time in years. She gives Flint a locket with her picture inside of it, before he's ushered out of their apartment by nearby police sirens. After dropping MJ off at her apartment, Peter pays Aunt May a quick, unannounced visit, and tells her that he's going to ask Mary Jane to marry him, and soon. After sharing the story about how she and Ben got engaged, and how they struggled, May gives Peter her blessing and ends up giving him the engagement ring that Ben had given to her. On his way home, Peter is attacked by Harry as the new goblin. The two fight, and Peter struggles to keep hold of the ring. The battle ends with Peter clotheslining Harry, sending him tumbling to the ground unconscious. Fearing that he may have accidentally killed him, Peter rushes Harry off to a nearby hospital. That same night, Captain Stacy of the NYPD is informed that Flint Marco has been located and there's a squad currently chasing after him. Stumbling into a pit of sand in a particle physics test facility, Flint is caught inside of a currently ongoing demolecularization test and becomes one with the sand beneath him. Sometime during the same night, Frances Barrison, the wife of Michael Morbius, stumbles upon another meteor shard carrying symbiotic goo similar to the one that landed near Peter and MJ. The symbiote attaches itself to her, and due to her lack of spider powers, the goo is able to take control of her more easily, and causes her to go insane. The symbiote also gives Francis the ability to take control of other people's minds. Using these powers, Francis accidentally turns Morbius into a vampire by releasing blood pathogens he was researching on. After poisoning her husband, Francis would go on to infect many more people, creating the gang known as the Waste Tribe. The next morning, Flint begins to reassemble himself with the sand particles and becomes the Sandman. At the same moment, Peter eagerly awaits the news on Harry's condition, learning that there has been some sort of short-term memory impairment, and Harry has suffered from amnesia, losing all of his recent memories between his father's death and the present day, which is pretty convenient for Peter. 
Upon returning to his apartment, Peter sets a reservation at Restaurant Constellation for Monday at 7.30pm, where he plans on proposing to Mary Jane. MJ arrives to read a negative review about her play to him, only for Peter to try and empathize his bad luck as Spider-Man to the negative review. Across the city, a crane begins to malfunction and rapidly swings back and forth. Peter hears of the out-of-control crane on his police scanner and rushes off to go stop it, leaving Mary Jane behind and saddened after Peter's lack of empathy. The black symbiote goo begins to make itself at home within Peter's room as she leaves. The out-of-control crane smashes into a nearby building where Gwen Stacy is having a modeling photo shoot to help make a quick buck to pay for her classes. The crane knocks out the floor that Gwen just so happens to be on, and debris is sent flying down to the ground below. On the ground, Captain Stacy's squad tries to cut power to the entire block, just as Eddie Brock, the new photographer for the Daily Bugle, begins taking pictures of the scene. He introduces himself to Captain Stacy, believing that he and Gwen are dating. Rushing off towards the building, Spider-Man dodges debris and saves Gwen as she's falling to her death. Eddie begins taking pictures of Spider-Man, claiming to be the new official photographer for the wall crawler. Afterwards, Eddie delivers his photos of Spider-Man to Jameson. Peter arrives at the same time and shows his own photos to Jameson, but JJ ultimately chooses Eddie's over his. The rivalry between these two photographers heats up as Jameson offers a staff job to the two of them, and whoever can get an incriminating picture of Spider-Man first gets the job. Upon leaving the Bugle, Peter walks through Times Square and learns that Spider-Man is being offered the key to the city after saving the daughter of the police chief. Harry is released from the hospital and Peter accompanies him to his mansion, bringing along an old basketball that the two used to play with. Peter and Harry rebond over their lost friendship, only for Harry to begin questioning about his father. Peter avoids telling the truth about who Norman really was and witnesses that Harry still retains his skills from the Goblin formula. Meanwhile, Mary Jane visits the theater where her play took place and learns that she's being replaced with another actress due to the negative reviews that she received. Leaving the theater in a distressed mood, MJ is bombarded by an applauding crowd, only they weren't clapping for her, they were clapping for Spider-Man. Once the key ceremony begins the next day, Peter attends the event where a large mass of the city's citizens have gathered together to celebrate their hero. Peter gets caught up in the moment, and instead of cheering up MJ when she needed it, he basks in the glory of everyone finally celebrating Spider-Man for once. After Peter abandons MJ once more in favor of Spider-Man duties, Harry meets up with her and manages to be that supporting rock for her that Peter had neglected on being. Gwen begins her speech and everyone begins praising Spider-Man as he swings in. The crowd encourages Gwen to kiss him, and getting caught up in the moment, Peter lets it happen. Mary Jane gets jealous over Gwen reenacting her first kiss with Spidey, and so she runs off. Meanwhile, Sandman is spotted near the ceremony by NYPD, but before they can apprehend him, he disguises himself in the back of a truck carrying a ton of sand. Attacking the cops and escaping, Sandman flies by the ceremony, forcing Spider-Man to chase after him. Sandman infiltrates an armored truck in an attempt to steal cash, but Spider-Man interferes, saving the truck drivers in the process. The two fight for a while, both inside and outside of the truck, but Sandman eventually causes the truck to crash and he escapes, leaving Peter behind to let the sand out of his mask and boots. That next night, Peter heads to his reservation at Restaurant Constellation and gives the maitre d' his engagement ring in hopes of surprising Mary Jane. MJ arrives and the two get into an argument over Spider-Man's kiss with Gwen, only for Gwen to pop in and say hello to Peter, adding on to MJ's jealousy. Expressing her upset feelings about Peter arrogantly gloating about the city loving Spider-Man while the world is crumbling around her, flipping the roles that these two had in Spider-Man 2, Mary Jane leaves the restaurant before Peter can pop the question. The next morning, Peter gives Mary Jane some space after her outburst and decides to go out on patrol. He decides it's finally time to pay Scorpion a visit in his hideout to discuss their plan on infiltrating Mecha Biocon. Traveling through the sewers to infiltrate their facility through their underwater tunnels, Spider-Man and Scorpion stumble upon Rhino, who has been instructed by Stillwell into taking Jessica hostage. The two chase after Rhino, with Scorpion leaving Spidey behind so he can track Stillwell down. Scorpion stumbles upon Jessica being held at gunpoint by Stillwell, who threatens to kill her unless if Scorpion kills Spider-Man and returns to NBC to continue research on the Scorpion project. Scorpion denies her request, and Stillwell decides to terminate the Scorpion project as a result, ordering Rhino to terminate both he and Spider-Man. Taking out guards and evading security systems, Spider-Man joins the fight alongside Scorpion, and the two take on Rhino. 
With their teamwork, the two are able to defeat him and rescue Jessica. Scorpion threatens Stillwell to make him normal, but she reveals that the damages done to his body are irreversible. Spidey tries calming Scorpion down and tells him to let the police deal with Stillwell, but Scorpion vows to make her pay for her crimes himself. Jessica manages to get through to Scorpion, and he ultimately runs off, ashamed of what he's become and saddened that he won't ever be normal again. With his job done, Spider-Man leaves Jessica to explain everything to the police, and with their experiments now being exposed to the world, it's most likely that Mecha Biocon went under. That evening, Peter tries calling MJ in hopes of making up for their argument over dinner, but he has no luck. The phone rings, but instead of it being MJ calling back, it's a detective from the 32nd Precinct inviting Peter to the police station. Upon arriving at the police station, both Peter and Aunt May learn that Dennis Carradine was only an accomplice to Uncle Ben's murder, and that the real killer, Flint Marco, is still out there. Peter gets reasonably upset after reliving the night of Uncle Ben's death in his mind, and lashes out at Captain Stacy, wondering why they weren't told any of this information over the past several years. With Uncle Ben's true killer now being known, Peter realizes that he couldn't have changed the outcome of his death and his entire purpose of being Spider-Man has now become null and void. That same night, Flint Marco tracks Dr. Ralph Wallace down to a medical research facility that he works at, he delivers the stolen money from the armored truck to him, only for the doctor to state that there still isn't enough resources he could use to help Penny. With his new sand powers, Flint threatens Wallace into continuing his research and heads off into the night in search of more money for funding. Returning to his apartment, Peter listens in on his police scanner hoping to track Flint Marco down for himself and enact vengeance. MJ arrives at Peter's apartment trying to console him, but he pushes her away and spends the rest of the night listening in on the scanner, only for him to fall asleep and have a nightmare about Ben's death. The black symbiote, sensing Peter's emotions, creeps over to Peter's bed and decides that now was the perfect time to attach itself to him, forming a new and stylish black suit. Taking Peter's body out into the city, Peter gains composure of himself and embraces the suit's power, as it not only makes him stronger and faster, it was relaxing him of his current emotions. He decides to take the suit out for a spin for a while, and tests his newfound strength by helping a group of cops take on the remaining members of the Apocalypse gang running amok. That next morning, Kraven and Calypso arrive back in New York City, with Kraven still vowing to hunt down Spider-Man after their first encounter. However, the true reason for the couple's return is due to the recent lizard outbreak. The two take on this new challenge and begin their hunt throughout the city for Dr. Connors. Meanwhile, Peter is late for work at the Daily Bugle, and arrives only to learn that Jameson sent Eddie Brock to the district attorney's office to take pictures of a press conference. The conference is about a criminal investigation being launched against Wilson Fisk, about his possible involvement with the crooked cops and the three gangs that were exposed by Spidey and DeWolf. Electro, a super-powered individual hired by Wilson Fisk, attacks the conference. Spider-Man rushes over and encounters Electro as he's kidnapping the assistant district attorney. But unfortunately, he loses him, only to spot Kingpin leaving the scene of the crime in a limo. Spidey follows the limo back to Kingpin's mansion and confronts him in his office, with Kingpin giving Spider-Man the location of Electro without hesitation. Spider-Man lets him off the hook for the time being, considering there's still an in-progress investigation into his criminal activity. On his way to the construction site, Spider-Man spots Eddie acting suspicious and decides to take a detour to check in on him really quick. It turns out that in desperation for the staff job, Eddie has hired a chubby imposter to pose as Spider-Man in an incriminating photo so he can easily obtain the staff job. Spidey quickly puts a stop to that by punching Eddie in the face, taking his camera, and getting rid of the other cameras that he had planted around the area. Spidey leaves and returns to his rescue mission as Eddie vows that he'll get some dirt on Spider-Man no matter what. Heading to the construction site of the Kingpin's new Fisk Tower building that night, Spidey faces off against Electro, defeats him, and rescues the assistant district attorney. The next morning, Peter overhears about a resurgence in lizard people and interrogates the remaining members of the Dragon Tail gang, getting a lead on disturbances in the sewer. Spider-Man heads into the sewer hoping to find new leads on the lizard's location, but stumbles upon lizard people stabbed with hunting weapons. The water that the lizard had escaped into is gone, and Spider-Man ventures down deeper into the sewer. Following the sounds of fighting, Spidey stumbles upon Kraven killing the lizard people in his hunt for Connors, and chases after him, all while fending off more lizard people that Connors had converted since their last encounter. Kraven and Calypso catch up to Connors and are about to kill him before Spider-Man steps in, allowing the lizard to escape. 
Calypso chases after the lizard as Kraven stays back to finally rematch Spider-Man after all this time. During their fight, Kraven utilizes some of Calypso's potions to replicate different powers of animals, intending on making the outcome of this rematch different from their first bout. Spider-Man manages to get the upper hand on Kraven thanks to his black suit, and during their fight, Calypso manages to catch the lizard, using her magic to amplify his size tenfold, turning him into the Mega Lizard. After defeating Kraven, Spider-Man runs off to confront Mega Lizard and defeats him, converting him back into Kurt Connors. Kraven and Calypso seemingly get away, as Spider-Man reflects on his more violent actions of almost killing Connors. With the battle won, Peter takes Connors to seek medical attention. Peter heads to the Daily Bugle the next morning, and Jameson orders him to get to the courthouse, as the Chief of Police is holding a press conference. Arriving late to the courthouse, Peter heads to the balcony and watches as the Chief of Police has all of the leaders of the gangs terrorizing the city in custody thanks to Spider-Man's efforts. After getting his pictures, Peter learns that Wilson Fisk is also at the conference, employing gang members from all three gangs to free their leaders. With Fisk now confirmed to have been working alongside the three major gangs running around New York as the Kingpin, Peter deals with the gang members running around the courthouse, but is unable to stop Fisk and the gang leaders before they escape. Heading towards Kingpin's mansion, Spider-Man breaks into Fisk's office to confront him, vowing to put a stop to his entire crime empire. Spider-Man proceeds to fight the members and leaders of the Apocalypse Gang, Dragon Tails, and Arsenic Candies, putting a stop to these gangs once and for all, before moving on to the Kingpin himself. Even with his black suit, Spider-Man is no match for Fisk as he gets utterly destroyed in their fight, but due to his growing rage, his power spikes and he launches the Kingpin out of his office window. With no body found, nobody knows whether or not Fisk actually died from the fall, but the fact that Spidey could have accidentally killed him will forever haunt the web-slinger. Peter decides to head home and take a break from the black suit for a while, believing that it was altering his personality. He returns to his classic red and blue suit for a while, noticing that there are still some lizard people running around the city, despite Connors reverting back to normal. Paying Kurt a visit in his hospital room, Spidey requests Connors' help in finding out how to revert everyone back to normal. Connors tells Spidey to bring him a sample of the regeneration serum from the sewer lair that the lizard resided in. Despite suffering from PTSD due to his lizard transformation, Connors vows on making things right as Spider-Man embarks into the sewers where he retrieves the sample. The next day, Connors is out of the hospital and back to work at his lab. Spider-Man takes the regeneration serum to him, and he begins working on a cure. Given some time to kill, Spider-Man goes out to put a stop to any remaining lizard people, and tries to readjust to life without the black suit. But like a drug, he feels like he can't live without it. Later on, Connors completes the antidote and instructs Spider-Man to disperse it through gas dispensers in the sewer that the lizard initially set up to disperse his own lizard serum. Spider-Man succeeds in delivering the antidote, which turns everyone in the city back to normal people, and he returns to Connors' lab afterwards. Telling Kurt to be well, Spidey departs, and having redeemed himself, Connors returns to work, but he'll never be the same man again. That same night, Peter, as himself, takes part of the symbiote to Dr. Connors to figure out what it is, hoping to run some tests on it and learn more about it. The symbiote tries running back to Peter before he traps it in some glass. Connors warns Peter of the danger this goo might possess, and agrees to study it for him. Afterwards, Peter returns home and catches a scanning of Flint's location. Giving in to his hatred, Peter puts on the black suit knowing how dangerous it makes him, and tracks Flint down to the first eastern bank, where he spots sand leaking into a nearby grate. Eddie arrives on the scene and takes pictures of the new black-suited Spider-Man as he rips the grate out of the ground. Remembering his attempt at falsifying photos the other day, Spidey smashes Brock's camera and heads underground. Brock pulls out a digital camera and begins taking photos of the bank's damages. Following Sandman into the underground subway tunnels, Spider-Man attacks him full of rage and the two battle between incoming subway trains. The two tackle each other downwards past several different railways until Spider-Man wins the battle by ripping open a water pipe, washing Sandman away in a heap of mud, hoping to have killed the murderer of his uncle. Afterwards, Peter leaves the scene and sports a new hairdo to visually signify his growing darkness. After seemingly killing Flint Marco, Peter gives in to the black suit's influence and begins wearing it around under his clothing at all times. Heading to the Daily Bugle for work, Jameson shows Peter a newspaper from a competing paper business, the Daily Globe, talking about a man found drained of blood on a university campus. Jameson tells Peter to go out and get pictures of this rumored vampire, who of course ends up being Morbius. 
Figuring it would be best to wait until night to catch him, Peter heads to Columbia University that night and tries tracking Morbius down through police car scanners. He stumbles upon Morbius and manages to snag a picture, but the vampire runs off just as soon as the sun comes up. Immediately after capturing the picture, Peter delivers it to the Daily Bugle and then visits a tired Connors to see if any results on the symbiote have been found. Peter takes over the research and works the entire day running tests on it, trying to find answers about what this entity was that he was wearing around. Nighttime rolls around, and Peter overhears Morbius attacking a woman outside. Ticked off over the lack of results, Spider-Man squares off against Morbius until the morning sun rises once again, and Morbius is weakened. After defeating him, Spider-Man takes Morbius to Connors' lab, and once Kurt returns to work, Connors states that he's friends with this man. Upon waking up, Morbius requests help from Kurt and tells Spider-Man to locate his wife, the one responsible for giving him his vampiric abilities. Peter leaves the lab and tracks Francis down, learning that she is also infected with a symbiote similar to his own. Francis is now known as Shriek, and thanks to her mind control powers, has amassed a large cult following through the Waste Tribe gang. Spider-Man confronts Shriek in combat and she runs off, leaving Spidey behind to interrogate members of the Waste Tribe around the city to pinpoint the location of her lair. Returning to Connors' lab without Shriek by his side, Spider-Man offers to take Morbius to Shriek instead so she can cure him. The two head over to her hideout where Shriek takes control of her husband and forces him to fight Spider-Man against his will. During their fight, Shriek uses sonic blasts to knock the symbiote off of Spider-Man, and she tries to attack his mind by having him confront his loved ones and face the sins he's committed. Spider-Man eventually rebonds with his symbiote and defeats Shriek, who in turn cures Morbius, but she's left dying as a result. Taking the two back to Connors' lab, Spider-Man tells Kurt that sonic waves may be a key to understanding what the symbiote organism is. From this point on, it's implied that while studying the alien symbiote, Kurt and Morbius are able to cure Francis, and the two are able to return to a normal life, with Kurt now having a better understanding of the goo-like alien. After returning home to get a few hours of needed sleep, Peter wakes up the next morning and realizes that he's nearly forgotten about the staff job position. Hoping that Brock didn't already have it, Peter decides to take pictures of himself sporting his new black suit, hoping to capture the true spirit of what Spider-Man represents as opposed to the menacing pictures that JJ had wanted. Peter swings around with a volunteer, but due to his overexposure to the suit, he ends up being too rough on the person and they run off. Cops run up to Spider-Man insinuating that he recently mugged someone and thus, Spider-Man heads off to confront the imposter. Finding him wearing a black suit similar to his own but not as well detailed, Peter unmasks the imposter and learns that it's actually Eddie Brock, once again, trying to capture a falsified picture of Spider-Man mugging people. With this plan failing just like the previous one, Brock is forced to use the ace up his sleeve and begins to photoshop the images he took of the damages back at the bank. Now in a pissed off mood due to Eddie's persistence on framing Spider-Man, the negative influences of the symbiote begin to shine through as Peter returns to his apartment. Raising his voice against Mr. Ditkovich, Peter once again realizes that the suit is making him act out in a violent manner, on instinct, as opposed to it being controlled. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! On top of this, now knowing that it's a living, breathing entity, Peter takes it off to take a break from it once again and leaves the suit in his closet, wondering if he'll ever put it back on. Later on in the day after calming down, Peter realizes that he hasn't seen Aunt May ever since the debacle at the police station, so he pays her a little visit to tell her about the fate of Flint Marco at the hands of Spider-Man. May tells Peter that despite the things people have done, nobody has the right to take someone else's life and that revenge is a poison that can take over people's hearts, insinuating that it was wrong for Spider-Man to act out of character and kill Sandman. Meanwhile, Mary Jane applies for a singing waitress job at a bar and goes to visit Harry at his home, hoping to seek out his company as opposed to Peter's. The two begin cooking food together, dance together, and catch up over old memories only for the two to end up kissing one another. Cutting it off short realizing that it was wrong to do that to Peter, Mary Jane leaves and Harry, heartbroken at her sudden disappearance, begins to remember everything that he had forgotten in recent memory, including his mission to avenge his father. Peter returns to his apartment and apologizes to Mr. Ditkovich for his outburst. He tries calling Mary Jane to talk to her, since he also hasn't seen her in a while due to his Spider-Man activities, but he can't get through to her. Returning home just as Peter's calling, Mary Jane is attacked by Harry, who has now returned to his Elias as the new Goblin. He forces her to break up with Peter or else he'll go on to kill him. 
Waking up the next morning, Peter is informed by Ursula that Mary Jane called him back, hoping to meet up with him in Central Park. Bringing flowers and the engagement ring alongside him, Peter tries to patch things up with her, but is cut off by Mary Jane who breaks up with him, stating that she has fallen in love with someone else as Harry watches from the sidelines. Later on in the day, Harry calls Peter, and the two head out to a local cafe together, with Peter venting his frustrations out to him. Harry reveals news about MJ that Peter himself didn't know, such as her being fired from her play and her new job as a singing waitress, and on top of this, Harry reveals to Peter that he was the other guy that MJ was talking about. Peter leaves the cafe in disbelief, and it's implied that Peter now realizes that Harry got his memories back. Returning to his apartment that night, Peter is heartbroken and distraught thinking about how Harry destroyed his relationship with MJ and thus, like an addict, dons the black suit once more to go confront him. Attacking him in his own home, the fight gets personal as Peter fights Harry, tossing each other around the room until the two smash into the goblin lair. Gaining the upper hand on Harry, Peter begins talking down on Harry and starts insulting him, leading Harry into throwing a pumpkin bomb at his former friend's back only to have it tossed right back in his face. With his payback on Harry complete, Peter begins wearing the black suit again, realizing it was the only thing that could possibly make him happy at this moment in time. And besides, what else did he have left to lose? When out taking a stroll, Peter stumbles upon the newest Daily Bugle paper with a fake image of black-suited Spider-Man on the front page, robbing the bank that Sandman had attacked several days prior. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. Heading to the Bugle, Peter confronts Eddie for plagiarizing his old photos, and ultimately gets Eddie fired from the staff job that Jameson had given him, forcing the Bugle to print a retraction. Thrown out of his job, Eddie pays a visit to Gwen at her home, trying to seek solace from her, but she, as well as her parents, turn him away and push him out of their lives due to his deceptions. He not only deceived the police force, but the entire city through his selfish desires to obtain the staff job and frame Spider-Man. Brock was shut off from the entire world around him at this point. After getting Eddie fired, Peter takes the black suit out into the city to relieve some stress and returns to his apartment that night, where he gets a call from Dr. Connors who states that the symbiote amplifies characteristics of its host, most notably aggression. This info is a bit too late since Peter already knew of the side effects of the symbiote firsthand, and at this point, he just didn't care. Much like a stress ball, Peter started relying on the black suit more and more because it helped relax him. By this point, the suit begins corrupting him more and more with each usage, shifting his personality and amplifying his own traits that he perceived as cool. At the Daily Bugle, Peter hits on Betty Brant before delivering photos of the new, improved Spider-Man to Jameson. With the suit giving him confidence, Peter demands the staff job that Eddie was fired from in return for the photos, and with Peter now being his only photographer, Jameson reluctantly gives him the job. Upon leaving the Bugle, Peter begins dancing down the street awkwardly, as people watch him enter a clothing store and leave with a new stylish outfit to reflect his new, cool guy attitude. That night, Flint Marco finally emerges from the sewer systems and reverts out of his mud state back into his regular appearance. Flint's wife, Emma, takes Penny to a local park the next morning, and while there, Penny notices a gigantic castle made out of sand. Amazed at it, Penny gets close and embraces it, feeling a level of warmth emanate from it that only her father could give off. The castle disappears once Penny and her mother leave, with Flint watching them from afar. He promises himself that he can't give up fighting to make her better, despite just going through a near-death experience. Meanwhile, Peter runs into Gwen on their college campus and asks her out on a date that night, hoping to get revenge on Mary Jane, similarly to what he did with Harry. While hesitant at first due to Eddie's unannounced visit and clinginess, Gwen ultimately agrees and the two head out that night. Peter takes Gwen to the same bar that Mary Jane recently began working at, with Eddie Brock stalking the two of them, heartbroken at the fact that not only did Peter get him fired, but now he stole the girl that he loved. Hoping to make MJ jealous, Peter shows off in the bar and uses Gwen as a tool against Mary Jane, only to have security thrown at him trying to toss him out. Peter rolls around a bit and hits Mary Jane in the chaos. She catches a glimpse of the black costume underneath Peter's fancy new suit and pieces everything together, realizing that somehow, this new black costume was altering who Peter truly was. Disgusted by his actions, Peter quickly leaves the bar realizing that the black suit pushed him way too far this time. Hearing nearby church bells, Peter decides to ditch his fancy suit and perch on top of the church for a while in the rain, recounting all of the despicable actions that he had done while in this suit. 
Dropping down into the church's bell tower, Peter begins removing the black suit, but it struggles to stay attached, having bonded to Peter for a considerable amount of time. Fighting to regain his life back, Peter smacks into the bell and the suit reacts to it. With sound being the weakness of the symbiote, Peter continues smacking himself into the bell, and the symbiote quickly begins to separate itself from him. At the exact same time, Eddie enters the church down below and pleads for God to kill Peter Parker for destroying his life. The black symbiote falls down onto Eddie Brock as some sort of twisted answer to his prayers, and he becomes the monster known as Venom. Angered that Peter had rejected it, the symbiote's hatred is now represented on the surface with Venom sporting jagged teeth, an elongated tongue, and a messier web pattern similar to Spider-Man's. Within the suit, Eddie is freaking out, trying to get it off of him, but he ultimately passes out and ends up outside in an alleyway in the pouring rain. Nearby, a group of teenagers are trying to buy hot dogs from a closed vendor, and Venom attacks them. Because the suit was bonded to Peter for so long, it inherited some of Peter's memories, and thus, Eddie begins to relive all of the memories of Peter Parker. The cops show up to apprehend Venom, but they end up shooting at him, forcing him to flee. Adjusting to the way the suit breathes for him, Eddie gets a clearer memory, and he learns that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Utilizing Spider-Man's powers as his own, Venom swings over to Gwen's home just as Captain Stacy is called in for Venom's attack on the hot dog vendor. Hoping to steal her love back from Peter, Venom steps into her apartment but finds the case file for the Ben Parker homicide that Captain Stacy brought home with him. Finding Flint Marco's picture, he decides that there's a better way at getting back at Parker other than stealing Gwen's love. After stripping the black suit, Peter returns to his apartment and discovers that Mr. Ditkovich actually did end up fixing his door due to his outburst from the other day. He showers to fully cleanse himself of the black suit and its sensation on his skin, but he still kept that guilt of what he's done. Before heading off to locate Flint Marco, Eddie Brock stops by Peter's apartment thanks to the black suit's memory of its location. While Peter is in the shower, Brock rummages through Peter's belongings and stumbles upon pictures of Mary Jane. But rather than harm Peter through hurting Gwen, and rather than simply killing him on the spot, Eddie gets the idea to take MJ away from Peter, similar to how Gwen was taken from him, and he plans on making Peter's death slow and miserable. A short while passes, and Aunt May arrives to talk with Peter before he tries giving the engagement ring back to her, but she leaves it there with him, knowing that he'll learn to forgive himself for hurting Mary Jane and will eventually do the right thing. Peter later walks on the street near MJ's apartment, but can't get himself to apologize to her just yet. Venom tracks down Sandman and coerces him into working alongside him to kill Spider-Man, since he couldn't possibly take down the two of them at the same time. And besides, how ironic would it be for Peter to be killed by the same man who killed his uncle? The two team up and steal a taxi, using it to abduct Mary Jane and take her to a construction site where they call out Spider-Man by name, baiting him into rescuing her. Waking up in the taxi that is now dangled high in the air, Venom terrorizes MJ, but Sandman tells him to leave her alone. They're only there to put an end to Spider-Man. By this point, the hostage situation is all over the news with the entire city tuning in to watch it. Peter dons his classic red and blue suit and goes off to save her, stopping at Harry's house along the way, hoping to get his help in defeating the two villains, as after all, they both loved MJ. Harry doesn't compromise and tells him to get lost. Peter accepts his answer, and heads off to fight Venom and Sandman alone. After Peter leaves, Bernard decides it's finally time to tell Harry the truth about his father, about how he cleaned his wounds, and that he was responsible for his own death. With the truth now being revealed, Harry once again starts to struggle with what he should do. Peter was his friend, and MJ needed their help, but did Peter really deserve his help after the stunt he pulled the other day? After arriving at the construction site, Spider-Man reveals himself to Mary Jane, but gets ambushed by Venom, who didn't trigger his spider sense. The two villains prove to be too powerful for Peter to handle, due to the unpredictability and power of Venom, as well as the sheer size and towering demeanor of the Sandman. Combining their efforts, the two manage to pin Spidey down, and proceed on beating him down, however Harry steps in as the new Goblin, and saves Peter just in the nick of time. With their friendship rekindled, Peter and Harry take on Venom and Sandman together, saving Mary Jane in the process. As the new Goblin defeats Sandman, Spider-Man goes on to fight Venom alone with the symbiote outclassing him in every single way possible. With Spider-Man restricted, Venom goes to kill Spider-Man with the new Goblin's glider, but Harry steps in between the two of them and takes the hit instead. Sacrificing his own life to save Peter, Harry is tossed aside by Venom like a piece of trash. 
Given the opportunity to attack, Peter lashes out at Venom out of anger and manages to detach Eddie from the symbiote, utilizing sound waves into weakening their bond. Attempting to finally rid the world of the symbiote, Peter throws a pumpkin bomb at the alien goo, only for Eddie to throw himself into the explosion as well, which is powerful enough to completely obliterate both he and the symbiote together, with nothing left behind. After the battle is won, Sandman has reformed himself and confronts Spider-Man, but rather than battle him, he simply tells him the truth about what really happened with Uncle Ben's death and how it was an accident. Peter, deciding that he had gone far enough letting vengeance consume him, forgives Sandman and lets him go with Flint most likely heading off to return to Penny and be with her in the time that she had left. Reuniting with Mary Jane, Peter and Harry officially apologize to one another for the hardships that they caused, and Harry dies in the arms of his best friends. With Harry's death, the Goblin legacy has now finally come full circle, starting with Norman who was intent on killing Spider-Man, only to be killed by his own glider, leading to Harry redeeming himself and to an extent his father by saving Spider-Man's life. A few days pass, and a funeral is held for Harry Osborn, where Peter, MJ, and all of Harry's friends and colleagues pay their respects. It's implied that at this funeral, Peter makes up to Gwen Stacy and apologizes for using her to get back at Mary Jane. Despite this though, Mary Jane still needs some time to forgive Peter for what he had done. I'd say it took about a week for Peter and Mary Jane to fully mourn the loss of their best friend. At this point, Peter returns to the bar that Mary Jane now works at, with the bar's security paying close attention to Peter at all times, and the two share one final dance, ending the Raimi trilogy. After the events of Spider-Man 3, Peter slowly regains his life and rebuilds his image with the city, vowing that the best way to honor the people he loves is to never stop being Spider-Man, even despite all of the mistakes he's made. It didn't matter that Ben's death was unavoidable, at this point, Peter knows he's done so much good for the city, and those final words spoken to him by Uncle Ben were always going to follow him to the grave, as they've not only made him a better person, but they've helped save the city, and ultimately the world, from destruction so many times. It's most likely that Peter and Mary Jane mended their relationship, regardless of how long it took to rebuild that trust and loving connection that the two had, and Peter eventually managed to propose to her. The two no doubt ended up as a married couple, and Peter returned to a perfect life, balancing his career as Spider-Man as New York's protector, and now being a stable husband for Mary Jane with the staff job that he had at the Daily Bugle. We don't see or hear anything from this universe's version of Peter Parker for quite some time, until the Spider-Verse event in the comics, with Peter appearing as one of the many spider totems in Master Weaver's web, later being implied to have joined the fight against the Inheritors. However, while that's all we've seen of this Spider-Man up until now, the game Spider-Man Friend or Foe is based off of the movies, and technically follows the plot and characters of the Raimi trilogy after Spider-Man 3, but with a few minor changes that makes it impossible to have occurred in the same reality. Set in the Divergent Universe of Earth 71002, where none of Spider-Man's villains died off, Spider-Man is recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. director Nick Fury to track down meteor shards across the world in order to stop the looming threat of the symbiotic phantoms. The same meteor that the Venom symbiote was part of broke apart in Earth's atmosphere and different shards of it landed across the globe, which makes sense if you factor in the multiple shooting stars that Peter and MJ saw in Spider-Man 3 and the fact that Shriek found a separate meteorite from Peter. Sending Spider-Man to the locations of Tokyo, Japan, Tangaroa Island, Cairo, Egypt, Transylvania, and Nepal, Spidey defeats phantoms while searching for these shards, defeats his mind-controlled supervillains, and recruits them to fight alongside him, and he traces the phantom threat back to Mysterio, who he defeats. With all of the shards brought to and analyzed by S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury names the study Project Carnage. If you want to consider this canon to the Raimi timeline, that's up to you, but I just thought I'd mention it since it bears the same characteristics of the Raimi trilogy. With Earth 96283's timeline officially ending after Spider-Man 3, the story of this universe's Peter Parker is left off on an open-ended note that could be revisited in the future. With Sam Raimi set to direct Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness and the recent rumors of Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man appearing in Tom Holland's third Spider-Man movie, it's entirely up to Raimi's creative input and the executives at Marvel if they want to incorporate Toby into the MCU as one of those many multiverses that we're going to be introduced to. It's entirely possible for the story of this Spider-Man to continue through those two movies, but personally, 
I would love to see him return in a sequel to Into the Spider-Verse. Either way though, I will definitely be excited if Toby returns. For now though, he's been able to live on in the hearts of fans through memes and the constant discussions of what Spider-Man 4 could have been with non-stop theories and constant artwork. It's no surprise that Sam Raimi's trilogy left a huge legacy behind for the character, with many people, including myself, being first introduced to the Spider-Man character through these movies and games, and the impact of this trilogy has bled into many other pieces of comic book related media. So to all those who worked alongside Raimi on these fantastic movies, I cannot thank you guys enough for introducing me to this character, and you all deserve to know that the passion and love put into those films helped shape the lives of those who watched them. And now, we finally reached the end of this timeline that may or may not be continued in the future. I want to hear all of your thoughts on this timeline that I put together. Now, there were a few inconsistencies with dates between the canonical movies and the extended lore that we saw in the novels, such as the Fight Promoter's paper saying that the date was June 21st, and Spider-Man 2 supposedly taking place in April when it should have actually been around August. But most of these details can be winked at. Plus, like I said, even though I came up with a few dates based off context clues, the only things canon to the Raimi trilogy is in fact the three movies directed by Sam Raimi. I highly recommend you go back and watch those three movies, and you should also check out the games and novelizations. You won't be disappointed. Before I let you go though, since this is a really long video, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Twitter user at LowResJPG, who is responsible for those astonishing renders of the Spider-Man costumes seen throughout the video. You know, those renders on the right side of the screen? Yeah, he made them, so if you want to go check out work similar to those models, and even want to get something commissioned, make sure to go check them out on Twitter. Link will be down in the description. If you enjoyed watching this very long and detailed timeline of Sam Raimi's trilogy, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and share it with all your friends and family. Any and all support would be appreciated so I can keep making videos like this. There was a lot of effort and research put into this video, but I absolutely loved every single second of it, so if you guys would share this out, give it a like, and subscribe, I would definitely appreciate that. Now, even though I covered basically everything there is to know about Raimi's Spider-Man in this timeline, I didn't actually review anything, so sometime in the future, I do plan on reviewing all the movies, books, and games. Once again, I hope you all enjoyed today's video, and if you're a fan of Spider-Man, you'll definitely want to stick around on my channel. Until my next video, though, I'll be seeing all of you Spider-Man fans later. See ya!